Hello, MCU fans. Today is going to be my cover-to-cover -cover breakdown of the entire Marvel Cinematic Universe official timeline book. I am so glad this thing came out because now we officially know when everything in phases one through four occurs. So I'll be covering the movies, the shows, the one-shots, flashbacks, post-credit scenes. If it's in the book, we'll be talking about it. And it'll all be at a very high level because otherwise we'd never get through all of this. But it is worth mentioning Technically speaking, there are spoilers for, you know, like the entire Marvel Cinematic Universe, but I'm sure you get that. I'm sure you've seen everything already, so we should be fine. Now, I will also be including Phase 5, which isn't in the book, but it's nice to see how it fits in because there's some flashbacks that fit in nicely with the rest of the MCU. But because not everyone has seen the Marvels, that potentially at least, I hope you go see it. It's a good movie. But anyway, I will make a separate section for that so you can skip by it uh, if desired. All right, without further ado, let's dive right in, see what we can find out. Okay, so there is the November contest. As a reminder, all you have to do to enter is be a subscriber and leave a comment. One random winner will be announced on the video in early December and can choose from one of the books or steal books above. Best of luck. Also, don't forget that I have a new membership option available. You get lots of cool perks. It's only 99 cents a month. So for anybody who wants to help me slowly get to the point of doing this full time, that would be great. But I also want to say, everyone that watches the videos, likes, subscribes, leaves comments, you're all supporting the channel. And I thank you all greatly. It means so much to me. So I want to point out that I do have several videos, nine in fact, on some of the more controversial placements in the book. I say controversial because, you know, fans don't agree on everything, and that's fine. So I made separate videos that go into detail on why I think the book made the choices it did, and I won't be going into those details in this video, or again, we, we would never get done. But I wanted you to know those are out there if you're interested. So let's talk a little bit about what is contained in the timeline book, in the forward by Feige. Uh, he writes uh, a couple things. You can read all of this if you want, but I'm just going to highlight a few things. He says there's 30 films, eight series, and four phases. So you can already tell right off the bat, eight series. That means he is not including anything that is pre-Disney+. Plus. So the Netflix shows, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., Agent Carter, etc. He even goes further to say that the timeline presented in the book is specific to MCU's sacred timeline. So he's not saying those other things aren't canon to the MCU. He's just saying they aren't canon to the sacred timeline. Now, you can still read this multiple different ways, so I'm not going to get into the debate on whether I think that's what he's saying. It just appears that way, so I'm just pointing that out. But more importantly, whether or not it's on the sacred timeline or not, the book doesn't include those things, so I won't be including them in this video either. Um, and in fact, he does go on further to say this is the entire history of the MCU unraveled from end to end. So you can interpret all that however you feel, but I just wanted you to know why the book doesn't cover the pre-Disney Plus stuff and therefore why I'm not doing it in this video either. Now, Miss Minutes shows up multiple times with snarky comments. And one that I want to point out right up front, please don't shoot the messenger, but she repeatedly calls the sacred timeline 616. So I know there's much debate on that, um, but just don't shoot the messenger. It's blame her, not me. Uh, also, it, she mentions it doesn't include the multiverse. So she's referring to like the Toby and the Andrew Spider-Man movies, even though it does include the Tom Holland Spider-Man movies and the Fox X-Men movies, etc., are not included. So I wanted to point out, I love all those shows and I have therefore created videos that you can watch on the timeline for the Netflix shows, the ABC shows, Hulu Freeform, Sony's, Fox's X-Men, etc., even the games. So check those out if you want more details on how those all work, but at least for this book, uh, for this video rather, and for the book itself, they do not cover these things. Uh, down in the lower right though, they do cover Fury's Big Week, but I go into great detail on day-by-day, scene-by-scene breakdown if you're interested in that. So very cool. Okay. Let's dive into this, right? So they have high-level categories, and the first one is Dawn of the Universe. And this is seen most um, immediately in the Eternals movie at the very beginning in, uh, when they give this incredible, just a couple sentences, but it covers so much. So they start with, in the beginning, before the six singularities and the dawn of creation came the Celestials. And the book indeed shows the Celestials doing their handiwork. I'm assuming those are probably the singularities since they're, basically the, the Celestial came even before the singularities. So they basically created them. Uh, also, the book covers the fact that ego was formed at this point. Now, he didn't form his planet yet, but he was born at this point. That fascinated me. I kind of assumed Ego was, I don't know, well into, well into uh, the, already the universe had been created, but nope, he's out there in the beginning. Uh, he says, first thing I remember is flickering adrift, utterly alone among the cosmos. 
and then says, over millions of years, I learned to control the molecules around me. So yeah, he, he's been there since the dawn of the universe. Wild. Uh, also, uh, we then learned from Guardians of the Galaxy that the six singularities then existed. So before creation itself, there were six singularities. And of course, those are going to become the Infinity Stones. In Thor the Dark World, even Odin mentions there are relics that predate the universe itself. And of course, he's talking about those singularities. So then in Eternals, we move to the point where Ereshem, the prime celestial, created the first sun and brought light into the universe. So here we see Ereshem doing his work. And uh, once again, in Guardians, I love, Collector gives us so much cool information, but he, he says the same thing the book said, then the universe exploded into existence and the remnants of these systems were forged into concentrated ingots, the infinity stones. So we had six singularities before the universe, and then they turned into the stones. And Wong also says the same thing at, in uh, Infinity War. Uh, at the dawn of the universe, there was nothing, then boom, the Big Bang sent six elemental crystals hurling across the virgin universe. And this is really important. He says these infinity stones each control an essential aspect of existence. It's very important. And uh, the, the ancient one says the same during Endgame. The infinity stones create what you experience as the flow of time, in particular the time stone. Now, they don't discuss the dawn of the universe from a multiverse standpoint, unfortunately. I wish they did. So I'm putting in this in red, and in fact, anytime I have something in red means it wasn't included in the book, but I really wish it was. Because even in Far From Home, granted Mysterio was a huckster and he was lying about a lot of stuff, but Peter Parker, on the other hand, is really smart. And when he heard about the multiverse, he says, sorry, you're saying there's a multiverse? I thought that was theoretical. That changes how we understand the initial singularity. So he's talking about the singularities before the Big Bang. We're talking about an eternal inflation system. So here he's talking about multiple Big Bangs. So I'm a little surprised they at least didn't include this. I really, really hope Marvel gives us a lot more information on how the multiverse works and, and, and was formed. Um, I do think in Loki, which also, that was part of phase four, <laughs> Loki did show us the two black holes, which are kind of the big crunch and then lead to the Big Bang. And of course, we went inside of one of those black holes and we saw the sacred timeline. So I don't know. I, I, it sure seems like they're saying there are multiple Big Bangs. And honestly, as I've talked about in some other videos, I don't know how we could get a paint and noir and cube and animated universes, as well as, of course, live action, unless the Infinity Stones which control how physics work, were formed differently, each through different big bangs. So one formed paint and one formed cubes, etc. The, the reality stones, I'm assuming, for each one. So anyway, it's not covered in the book. Big bummer. But down the road, hopefully, they'll, I, I want uh, a, a special edition on multiverse, please. Anyway, moving on to the rest of the Eternals uh, beginning, it says that life began and thrived and all was in balance. So now the Celestials are creating the solar system. So we're into the distant past now, and they mention the tree of the world being created, which this is the actual Yggdrasil, by the way. I know in some videos I've mentioned that Loki kind of created Yggdrasil he, in um, uh, Loki season two. That, that's not really what happened. He technically used that as the imagery for what he created. Yggdrasil is the nine realms, which includes earth. And so then they mention that the seed of Tiamat was planted in the earth. Uh, every billion years, new celestials must be born, and the planet earth was chosen to host the celestial Tiamat. Also, this is the first time they mention the dark elves. So it kind of seemed like the dark elves, at least in the comics, were around, you know, back with the celestials before the dawn of time. I mean, even Odin says, long before the birth of light, there was darkness, and from that darkness came the dark elves. But I'm wondering if the darkness he's referring to is Asgard wasn't there yet, since he really focused on Asgard. Um, in particular, he says, but before that dawn, okay, the dawn of Asgard? You know, it's a little hard to tell what he's discussing here. Uh, he says, the dark forces, though, the dark elves reigned absolute and unchallenged. But regardless of what he's really trying to indicate here, the book at least does not bring up the Dark Elves until the Nine Realms are being created. So make of that what you will. Uh, I, I would like to know more about the Dark Elves' origins sometime. Uh, anyway, uh, continuing with the distant past, uh, it meant the book mentions the Deviants are now created. Every celestial host planet has its own predators. I first sent the Deviants to exterminate them, but of course they became predators themselves. So the Celestials then create the Eternals. And I love how the book just calls it out. It says the Eternals are manufactured because, well, they are. They're robots, right? 
Um, then we also learn around this time frame, they don't give years, we're just talking the distant past, although this is the relative order, I should stress, uh, uh, of the timeline, because this is how the book lays it out. So around this time, um, the incantations of the dark hold are inscribed into Mount Wondegor. So the, if you remember, the books are not the original uh, dark hold. The, the, the actual spells are written on the walls of Mount Wondegor, and that's when this happens. Uh, then this is interesting. Now the Vibranium Meteor, or Meteors, as we now know, landed on Earth. Millions of years ago, a meteor made of vibranium you know, came and hit the Earth. Now, I don't know why they didn't go with this time frame that was given in uh, The Art of the Black Panther, because supposedly this is a canon book. But regardless, I'm pointing it out just so you know that we're probably talking around 2.5 million years ago. But nonetheless, they just uh, say it more vaguely at the distant past. What I found in general is the book doesn't try to give specifics if the movies didn't give specifics. They're not trying to add to canon, they're just trying to document canon, if that makes sense. And they must have considered this not canon. So, interesting. Nonetheless, uh, then we also learn this is around the same time frame when Ego begins to sow his seeds. Books, books wording, not mine. <laughs> but anyway, to sow his seeds across the universe. He obviously hasn't come to Earth yet, but he will eventually. So then we finally get our first physical date, because the movie itself gives the date, and that's 5000 BCE. Now, I don't want to get in the middle of a debate on whether it should be BC or BCE. The book uses BCE. Obviously, the movie used BC. So I'm just using what the book has. But yeah, anyway, not trying to do any messages here on which I think are correct and which are not. So the Eternals arrive. They give the first weapons to mankind, obviously. And there's their ship. And you got to have the group shot, right? Uh, so then we learned that the five tribes settled in the land of Africa. Now, this surprised me a little because I kind of thought Wakanda was settled before 5000 BCE, i.e. before the Eternals, but the book makes it seem like it is indeed after, shortly after. Uh, and I guess it's true. The movie says, and when the time of man came, which is implied that the Eternals came, you know, when man arrived. So, okay. The five tribes settled on it um, uh, and called it Wakanda. The tribes lived in constant war with each other until a warrior shaman received a vision from the panther goddess Bast. That warrior became king, the first Black Panther. Now, this is interesting. Same book, right? The Art of Black Panther does give us a year for this. It says that the first Black Panther was 10,000 years ago, and that's relative to when the movie is in the timeline, which is around 2016. So we're kind of talking then this would be 8,000 uh, BCE. And in fact... In the uh, series on Disney Plus called Empower, which features on uh, the women throughout several different series, but the one on Wakanda gives us the birth of Wakanda in 8000 BCE. So that's two different places it gave us this year. But obviously, it can't be 8000 BCE because we're already up to 5000. So very interesting. It seems like they have basically uh, thrown this out and said, no, we want Wakanda to form around the same time that the Eternals arrive. Okay, that, ma that makes sense. So then we move to uh, the mystic arts beginning. And in particular, they mention Agamotto uh, and uh, his spells and the stones, etc. cetera. Uh, so uh, it, it, again, they just kind of give this in vague, high-level terms, but the mystic arts, mystic arts began around this time. Also, the gods began coming to Earth. Uh, they show in the, in the book particularly uh, Khonshu, but uh, presumably this is when the gods started getting interesting, interested in mankind and coming down to you know, reveal themselves. Then we get another date. It's been a while since we got a date, but 2988 seems really specific, right? Malaketh observes the convergence. So why did they pick that? Well, because in Thor the Dark World, Thor says every 5,000 years, the worlds align perfectly. So if you take 2013, uh, which is when this movie uh, happens in the timeline, subtract 5,000 from it and deal with the fact there is no zero uh, year, you get 2988. So I'm glad that they use that specific year. Uh, then they go back to the distant past again and say that the dweller in darkness attacks and, and then is uh, kept behind the gate. So thousands of years ago, all our people lived in peace and prosperity until the attack of the dweller in darkness. Together, they pushed the dweller and his army into the dark gate and locked it behind them. And then we learned that our people have been here for over 4,000 years preparing for something we hope will never happen. So we kind of could figure out this roughly, but again, because they didn't give a specific time and just said around 4,000 years or over 4,000, that's why they stuck to the distant past. 
Uh, then we learn this is the same time frame that a Mjolnir was created, or Mew Mew. <laughs> Um, so that's important because soon after that, Odin and Hela subjugate the nine realms. So that's when this took place, uh, relatively speaking, in the timeline. Then we learn finally now the Darkhold is transcribed into a book. So now it's in book form. So it was just uh, spells uh, uh, and incantations on Mount Wondegore. Now it's in book form. And also remember from Multiverse of Madness, they did say that there are multiple copies. So for what it's worth, at least that element of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and Runaways, etc., isn't an issue. But nonetheless, those appear to be off on a branch. So do with that what you will. Um, then we get another date, 575 BCE, which is the Battle of Babylon. Obviously, the Eternals helped in that. And that's when Ajax first expresses her doubt about their mission on Earth. And you see the little teeny tiny Ajax there uh, talking to Arishem. Uh, then, okay, this is the first time when they didn't include something, uh, or one of the first times, I guess, that when they didn't include something I really thought they should have. Uh, they don't mention when the Kree Scroll War starts. So I'm putting where the wiki, uh, I love the Marvel Cinematic Universe wiki, as you know, uh, puts it, and where I also think it makes sense, because there's a deleted scene in Captain Marvel where Jan Rog asks the class, how long has the Kree Scroll War been going on? And they say thousands of years. So, okay, maybe that's 2,000 years. So take 2,000 from the present day in, in Captain Marvel, and you get a relative time frame. But again, they didn't even mention it, which is really interesting. Uh, then we move finally to A.D. or um, B.C. Uh, or sorry, C.E. Depending on which you prefer. Either way, I'm not going to put it anymore because there's no need. So everything from this point forward is obviously uh, C.E. or A.D. Now that is when Circe and Icarus are married, which is awesome. Very beautiful ceremony there. Uh, then we get to Hela being imprisoned. So that's wild. If you kind of do the math here, based on they don't give us the exact years, but you kind of get relative years. She was around wreaking havoc for quite some time. So finally she's in prison, and then actually the book says very soon after is when she breaks free and the Valkyries come and battle her and are mostly massacred. So we don't get a specific date, but relatively speaking, this is when it happened in the timeline. Then they also mention the Ancient One came around this basic time. They even say specifically that it's impossible to know when she um, first was born and first started dabbling in the dark arts that extended her life frame or lifetime. But, um, but it would have been around this time, they said, that she likely came into existence. Uh, then we move to the Dark Ages. And I think the main reason they mention this, of course, is because Makari collected so many interesting artifacts from the Dark Ages, as we learned in the movie. Uh, then we get to 965. That's when Odin battles, battles the Frost Giants. The battle started in Tonsberg, Norway. Uh, and then here we see the battle happening. And then the book actually does mention, I love that it mentions this, that sure enough, the Eternals helped. Because as Gilgamesh says, Odin taught me the special brew as a thank you after we helped defeat Lofi's army in Tonsberg. So kudos to the book for putting that in there. Then the battle moves to uh, the Jotunheim. And I thought it was kind of funny. For some reason, they moved to circa 965. So I don't know if they're saying they're not sure if we're still in 965. Maybe the battle went on for years. I don't know. That's interesting. But anyway, circa 965. Uh, and then, of course, that's where Odin finds a young Loki and adopts him. Little, little pouty frost giant. Little pouty lip. Um, and then this is interesting. So it certainly seems like Loki and Thor are the same age. Because in Ragnarok, Thor mentions uh, Loki uh, played a trick on him and ult ultimately stabbed him. And we were eight at the time. We were eight. So while they never specifically say when he's born, it sure seems like it would have been around the same time as um, Loki was adopted. Uh, in fact, though, Miss Minutes has a little fun with this because in Infinity War, Thor says he's 1,500 years old. And if you did that math, it would be way before uh, the 965 we just saw. So she jumps in with what she calls a red line alert, and I'll include these each time she appears. And she says, why, hello. Thor says he's 1,500 years old, but wasn't he just a baby around 695 CE? I'd have an answer for you all now, but Casey just spilled coffee all over the mainframe. Bless his heart. So yeah, she comes in to kind of rip on the fact that any time that continuity was a little messed up, she doesn't actually answer for sure what the uh, you know what should have been. Although I have to laugh while she's making fun of continuity issues. Notice she said six ninety five instead of nine sixty five. So oops, even Miss Minutes makes mistakes apparently. But yeah, I do appreciate that Marvel is having fun with themselves and pointing out when they made mistakes, uh, minor ones with the continuity. All right. 
So based on the fact that it does sound like Miss Minutes is implying Thor and Loki are the same age, and the movies obviously said the same, then we can take this Love and Thunder flashback where Frigga's carrying baby Thor into battle, and he's cooing. So, so Loki was pouting, and, and, and Thor is cooing. Just makes sense, right? Uh, so then we move to Thor running through the forest as a young child, and then uh, Odin relaying the Battle of Jotunheim to Thor and Loki from the first movie. Uh, flashback from the first movie, and then Teenage Thor running through the forest, and actually there's several running through the forest scenes, but these are the ones that are the easiest to place. Then they say Circa, once again, Circa 1000, the Kree and the Nova Empire War begins. And we get that because in Guardians of the Galaxy, um, Ronan says a thousand, years, a thousand years of war between us will not be forgotten. So you can backdate that and you get uh, to about a, a thousand, um, the CE or, or AD. Now, if you think about it, that means the Kree, though, are already at war with the Scrolls, and now they're at war with the Nova Empire? Oh, my word. I mean, they're at war with everybody. No wonder the Kree uh, planet suffered so much. Uh, all right, so then, uh, now notice they're calling it the Common Era when they don't give us a year. So this is just in the Common Era, when Wu discovers the Ten Rings. So uh, the legend of the Ten Rings has been told for thousands of years, but at its center, there's always one man. He chased money and power for 8,000 years. So that's how it's relatively placed, but I think they decided that wasn't firm enough, so they didn't go with a specific year. And even in the post credit scene for Shang-Chi, uh, Captain Marvel asks, how long did your dad have them before he gave them to you? And he says, about 1,000 years. So relatively speaking, this would be where it falls in the timeline. Um, I, I do kind of wish on some of these they'd gone ahead and just said, all right, we'll give you a date. But I appreciate that they're not trying to add information just to document what the movies have told us. All right, so in the common era, uh, Odin hides the Tesseract in Norway. Of course, uh, that's Schmidt noticing when he finally finds it, saying the Tesseract was the jewel of Odin's treasure room. Now, there was a timeline uh, that now has been essentially uh, you know, uh, decanonized because uh, there are some things that changed in the timeline book from this timeline. But for what it's worth, this timeline did say it was about 600 years ago that the Tesseract was hidden. So it, it fits, relatively speaking, we're around that time frame. All right, so then we get to 1521 when the Eternals finally eliminate the Deviants. And they do give us that date in the movie. Also, Thena experiences the Mad Weary. And the Eternals ultimately part ways uh, and, uh, you know, don't form as a team any longer. So then we get to 1571, which was given in the movie, which is when Namor is born, and there we see him being born underwater. And then they shift to the common era for when Namor buries his mother. Now, it's interesting. I had read that they did look at the scripts in case there was additional information, and notice in the script, 1631 is given as the date when uh, Namor goes to bury his mother. But Nonetheless, they chose not to choose that date, but I, I suspect that's relatively when it, when it happens. Then we get to 1693. Agatha Harkness is put on trial. They give us, of course, that date in WandaVision in a flashback, and there she is being drained of her powers. And then they mention something which they place in the common era, which is the rough history of Sokovia. Now, why they particularly pick Sokovia... I don't know beyond the fact that Maria Hill did say in Age of Ultron that they've had a very, very difficult history, lots of wars. So kind of setting the stage that it's been a tough go for Sokovia, and of course it does not end well in Age of Ultron. So then they say the 1920s is, quote unquote, the start of the line. So basically this time when uh, Steve and Bucky meet each other, uh, as kids, and then eventually, I don't think this particular line is in the 1920s, but relatively speaking, this is around the time frame when he says, I'm with you to the end of the line, pal. So I personally think it's a little later, so does the wiki, uh, but I think they're being general in their speaking here. Uh, so in the 1930s, that's when Kingo becomes a rising star, and he, uh, if you remember in Eternals, he was pointing out, that's my great-great-grandfather, and of course it was really him. Um, but this is interesting because I had thought when Loki showed the same poster, notice that's the same poster there, that it was weird because this was supposedly in the 70s and I couldn't figure out why they were showing a poster that I figured would be earlier. So it was nice to see the timeline book agrees that it was really from the 1930s. So probably this is just a historical poster up to honor um, you know, the legacy of, of, those, of, of Kingo's films, or maybe it took that long to come to America, but I, but I doubt it. So anyway, it, it's definitely not a, a, a 1970s poster is the key. All right, so then they don't specifically say when, so I'm putting this one in red, but there's a flashback to uh, Johann Schmidt being injected with the super soldier serum. 
but then they do specifically give us March of 1942. They do not often give us uh, a month. Often they, they they say like spring or fall or summer, but since the movie obviously said March, as you can see, then they said that is when Johann Schmidt now finds the Tesseract, uh, and there he is holding on to it. Uh, then in 1942, that's when Aisha and the clandestines find the bangle, one of the bangles, obviously, and you can see the 10 ring symbols. And I, uh, the, the bangles do get a lot more coverage in the Marvel's movie. I'm not going to go into that in case you haven't seen that movie, but it's pretty cool to see uh, just how powerful those bangles really are. But they, they only found one of them. And so, uh, you know, the other one, uh, as we've seen from trailers, uh, does get mentioned in uh, the Marvel's movie. So that's cool. Uh, so then Aisha flees from the British troops uh, after finding the bangle, and they actually give us a year at this point, 1942, and here she is fleeing uh, from the troops, and then she runs across uh, Hassan, and that's when they meet, uh, and he's saying, if I have to fight, or if we have to fight, we will fight. We have given our blood to this land for uh, thousands of years. So that's in 1942 that they meet. Then we get a very specific date. This is rare. They do not normally go down to a day, but... When it's in the movie, you got to, right? June 14th, 1943 is when Steve Rogers enlists, and you can see highlighted there, that's that's definitely the date. Then also June 22nd of 1943 is when Steve Rogers takes the serum and then does that dramatic saving of the kid and uses the door as a shield, which is really cool, but that's June 22nd. Then they say November 3rd through the 10th of 1943, that's when Captain America goes on a few missions, but most importantly, goes and rescues Bucky from captivity. Then in 1944, we get a flashback showing Aisha, who's now pregnant, walking with Hassan. This wasn't mentioned in the book, but it's clear you can place it because of her being pregnant. Um, then this is funny. So then they say the mid-1940s, Bucky's ill-fated mission. And this is a really important mission, remember, because they, they, they get onto the train, ultimately Bucky falls off into the ice, and they also capture Zola, all on this same mission. So it's really, really important, but they waffle and they say mid-1940s. So you might say, why'd they do that? Well, because the movies waffle. So the Winter Soldier says the Bucky Barnes quote-unquote died in 1944. Well, okay, so that would mean when he fell off the train. Fine, 1944 then. However, in Civil War, Captain America is saying, hey, if, if roles were reversed, Bucky would come after me. He'd come save me. And Sam says, yeah, 1945 maybe. In other words, before he turned into the Winter, winter Soldier and turned, um, you know, was, was brainwashed. But the point is, that means he was alive in 1945. So is it 1944 or is it 1945? And then more importantly, Zola, on the same mission where, where, where Bucky fell off the train, says, I may not be the man I was when Captain took me prisoner in 1945. So is it 1945 or is it 1944? Well, in comes Miss Minutes. She says, howdy, folks. When did Bucky fall from that train? We'd all like to know. The Smithsonian's Captain America exhibit says 1944, which we saw, but Arnim Zola claims he was captured in 1945. Those analysts must be getting their britches in a stir. Let me investigate who filed that paperwork. So she doesn't answer the question, but my opinion has got to be 1945. There's way too many things that say 45, and I think the 44 was just wrong. So very interesting. Um, all right, so then once again, mid-1940s, Bucky is located by the Soviet armed forces. So remember, he fell off the train into the ice, and then he's found by, by Soviet armed forces. Then they're back to giving us specifics. March of 1945, Steve Rogers crashes into the ice, and they're giving us that because of the newspaper heading. Now, because of some other sources, which clearly the book is not taking as canon, there are references to it being in February. So I will say some fans wished it had said February, but... At this point, it appears they're going with March uh, since, you know, the newspaper does give that date. So, um, uh, so March 1945. Then also in 1945, Fastos mourns his impact on the world, in particular, uh, the, the, um, the bombs on Hiroshima. And he just says, I did this. It's my fault, you know, because I gave them this technology. So very interesting. Uh, then in 1945, we get a flashback showing Aisha singing to young Sana. This was also not mentioned in the book, but you can figure out when this fits based on the fact that, you know, now Sana is born. Uh, then from 1945 to 1946, they basically say during that time span, they were searching both for Cap and for the Tesseract. They, of course, don't find Captain America, but it's probably easier to find the Tesseract, a giant glowing power thing down there. So uh, they let us know that time frame. Then in 1946, Agent Carter goes solo on the Zodiac mission, in other words, the one-shot, which they do tell us in the one-shot, it's one year later, 
And I'm a little surprised they didn't use March because the one shot gives us a specific uh, March of 1946 date. But of course, that's when she um, captures the Zodiac. And then in the post credit scene, she's invited to become the director of S.H.I.E.L.D. Now, right after that would be the um, Agent Carter series, but unfortunately they didn't include it in the book, which again, you know, whether, however you want to interpret that. Okay, so then we go to the late 1940s when Operation Paperclip brings in Arnim Zola. So Zola says in The Winter Soldier, it was Operation Paperclip after World War II, S.H.I.E.L.D. recruited German scientists with strategic value. So it wasn't too long after uh, he had been initially captured that now he officially became a part of S.H.I.E.L.D., which of course was the seeds for HYDRA taking over S.H.I.E.L.D. And interestingly, the book then mentions right after that, that that's when Bucky Barnes becomes a Winter Soldier, and of course, Zola helped with that. So boy, it didn't take long for him to be crooked, huh? He joins S.H.I.E.L.D., and immediately he's off uh, turning Bucky into the Winter Soldier. Yikes. And, and as he says here, you are to be the new fist of HYDRA. So then in 1947, Najma locates Aisha, wants her to use the bangle to get back to the Nord dimension, and they get into an argument. Um, uh, Aisha, Aisha and Hassan ult, uh, take Sana and ultimately head uh, to the train. Uh, they actually get in a specific date. This is August 15th of 1947, because that's uh, when the partition occurs, which that was one of my favorite things about the Miss Marvel series. I really enjoyed learning about the partition. Uh, and then, of course, Kamala gets pulled back in time uh, and ends up rescuing Sana, her grandmother, with the lights. And I thought this was interesting. You can read the whole entry if you want, but I just want to focus on this one part. It says, as she is dying, Aisha connects with the bangle, which falls off and summons her great-granddaughter Kamala Khan to the past. So, I mean, they, they, they kind of showed that in, in, in the actual series, but this makes it really clear. There was a connection between the bangle in 1947 and Kamala in uh, 2025, and that's what pulled her back. So yeah, definitely the, 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 um, the bangles have some type of time travel to them. I think they're Kang, Kang Tech, but we'll see. All right, so late 40s, early 50s, Isaiah Bradley is experimented upon. If you remember, he was in Falcon and Winter Soldier, and they gave him Super Soldier Serum. Uh, he says a handful of us got shot up with different versions of the serum. And then Bucky mentions, we had a skirmish during the Korean War. So isn't that interesting? At the same time, relatively speaking, Bucky is being experimented upon to become the Winter Soldier, and Isaiah Bradley in America is being experimented upon uh, to also become a fighter. So then they meet up in the Korean War and fight. We met in 51, which the book agrees with, says it's 1951. Um, and then sometime after that, it's not specific, but that's when Isaiah is wrongfully uh, accused uh, and, and is, is imprisoned. And we're going to see he's imprisoned for a long time, but it does mention when he gets out. All right, so in the 1950s to 1960s, it says that's when the Winter Soldier is used by Hydra on various missions. Uh, then 1953, I don't know why they didn't include this, so that's why it's in red, but Peggy Carter uh, interviews with the Smithsonian, and we saw this interview in the Winter Soldier uh, movie. Uh, then from 1963 to 1967 is, while Va is when Vanko, Anton Vanko, was working for Stark. So he started in 1963, and then eventually he's deported back to the Soviet Union because Stark accuses him of espionage, and that leads to the whole conflict in Iron Man 2. But Miss Minutes comes in with a red line alert. It says, hello there, folks. When Jarvis tells Tony Stark about Anton Vanko's history, he says the Soviet physicist defected to the United States in 1963. But a yellowed newspaper, Stark reads, cites October 16, 1966. During the Cold War, sometimes high-level defections were kept classified for several years, or it might just be a misprint. So in this case, the book does codify 1963. So in a lot of these cases you've seen, Miss Minutes comes in, points out an inconsistency, and dodges answering, which is the right thing. But here they're clear. It's really 1963, and the paper was just wrong. Uh, okay, then we move to 1970, and this is interesting. These, this is part of the time heist, so it isn't the sacred timeline. It's a branch. However, it's a direct branch off of the sacred timeline, so it gives us insight into what was happening. In particular, they go back to April 7th of 1970, and we see Howard Stark, which is really cool. We get a Zola reference, looking for Dr. Zola. Have you seen him? So Zola is still working for S.H.I.E.L.D. at this point. We're going to see not for long. That's coming up. Uh, we see a very uh, young Hank Pym, and we also see a very, very early Ant-Man prototype suit. I love that. That's straight out of the comics, uh, early comics. Uh, we also get a potential Captain Britain mention, because they mentioned Braddock's unit. 
Uh, and we see Peggy Carter, who is still the director of S.H.I.E.L.D., which makes sense. And we see Howard Stark trying to figure out how pregnant his wife is. He's not going to win Husband of the Year Award anytime soon. Remembering that this was April 7th, theoretically, Tony's birthday is May 29th, which is a date that was given in an Avengers deleted scene, but the book doesn't say whether or not that's his actual birthday. But it would make sense that there's about a month and a half to go uh, as Howard is trying to figure out how pregnant she is. And then we also see Howard's longtime butler, Jarvis. And this was a clear sign that surely Agent Carter had to be canon, the series, had to be canon to the sacred timeline, right? Well, it's not in the book, so make of that what you will. All right, so then we get an official date uh, of November 24th of 1971. That's when Loki hijacks a plane disguised as D.B. Cooper. So he actually is the real D.B. Cooper. And this was seen in the Loki season one uh, flashbacks. And then we get uh, some flashbacks from the Captain Marvel movie of a young Carol. They mention most of them in the book. This one is not specifically called out, so I'm using the date from the wiki, and that's why it's read there. But Carol Danvers looking up at the stars with her brother, and then Carol getting up after a tumble on the beach. Then in 1972, we get Arnim Zola's consciousness uh, being saved before his death. Because in Winter Soldier, he says, in 1972, I received a terminal diagnosis. So remember, we saw him in 1970, or, or we, he was mentioned at least in 1970 in, in the, during the time heist, and now he passes away just two years later. So very interesting. Then we have Howard Stark's film promo, uh, which was filmed in 1973. It's for the 1974 Stark Expo, which, of course, is the footage that uh, Stark was watching, and he learns how to uh, create the new element that saves his life. So very cool. Then they say in the mid-1970s, that's when Kingo is accused by his manservant of being a vampire, and is, he attempts to stab him, of course. Uh, but the, the key thing in the movie is they mention it was 50 years ago, so the timeline book places that in the mid-1970s, so that's cool. Then the timeline book does mention in the mid to late 1970s a couple different times when Carol gets up after an accident. So here she's getting up after a bicycle crash, here she's getting up after a go-kart racing injury, and then here she's getting up after stumbling during a baseball pitch. So very cool. Then they don't actually tell us when this happened, but uh, it, it apparently in the movie at least, uh, Ego and Meredith fell in love on one of his many visits. And so the wiki places that in 1978, but the book does mention specifically when Peter Quill is conceived in 1980 and mentions then that Ego and Meredith spend some more time together. And the movie, of course, uh, Guardians 1, uh, sorry, Guardians 2, gives us the 1980 date uh, officially. Uh, so there they are hanging out, singing together. Uh, then it tells us finally poor Isaiah Bradley in the early 1980s. That's when uh, Bradley fakes his death and is able to escape prison. So he isn't even released. He has to fake his death and, and get away. But uh, yeah, very sad, very, very tragic history. All right, then we get to 1984. Uh, when Carol takes part in an Air Force training exercise and she falls again. Now, the book did not include this, so the wiki goes with 1984 because that seems about when it would happen. But the book does include 1985 to 1986, a time frame for Trevor Slattery's a failed pilot with the drunk monkey. You remember um, in the All Hail the King one shot, he mentions this. So very funny that they actually placed that in the timeline book. You gotta love it. Uh, then in 1987, Hank and Janet have their ill-fated mission. There's Hank saying it was 1987, and there's a very nicely de-aged Michelle Pfeiffer. Uh, and of course, she goes subatomic and heads into the nuclear warhead, and now she is trapped in the quantum realm, but we will see more uh, about her coming up. Uh, then the, another small scene that wasn't included in the book, but I really think it's cool. It's Meredith and Peter Quill spending time together. This would have been not long before she got cancer, obviously, and, and died. So the, the wiki places it in 1987. In 1988, Peter Quill is taken from the Earth. They give us that date in the movie, obviously. Uh, and there he is being captured by Yondu and screaming, Mom. Boy, it's just heartbreaking. And then in Guardians uh, 3, uh, he actually mentions officially that I was eight when I left Earth, which is great because that syncs up perfectly that he would have been eight in 1988 because he was born in 1980. So, yay. Uh, then in the late 1980s, that's when the book places Ava Starr's parents being killed. And remember, she gets exposed to the quantum particles and uh, eventually becomes ghost uh, and is used by S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, uh, and then uh, shows up, obviously, in the Ant-Man and the Wasp movie down the road. In the late 1980s, that's when Marvell brings the scrolls to the orbiting space lab. 
So basically, it's right before uh, Carol gets uh, her powers when, when everything blows up on her, which we'll see in a moment. 1989, Hank Pym resigns from S.H.I.E.L.D. They give us the 1989 uh, date in the movie. And we see uh, Howard Stark at that time frame, what he looked like. We see a de-aged Michael Douglas and an aged up Peggy Atwell. That's pretty cool. Uh, playing, of course, uh, Ant-Man, uh, um, Pym, and um, Agent Carter. Uh, or I should say Director Carter. <laughs> Uh, and then in 1989, now we get to Carol Danvers absorbing the Tesseract energy. Remember in that explosion? And in the movie, they also tell you it is 1989 because Fury says it was six years ago. So that works perfectly. Then uh, another little minor scene, but I just think it's really cool, uh, that shows Yondu teaching Peter Quill how to use a blaster. That was not included in the book, but the wiki places it in 1989. And then for Christmas, I wish they would have included this. I just think that's really cool. We see Yondu... Um, getting so angry about the situation, uh, but ultimately, uh, and he kicks over the Christmas tree, remember at first, but ultimately then he gives Peter Quill blasters for Christmas, which is really cool. I love the holiday special. Be watching that again with Christmas coming up. Uh, then we get a specific date again, December 16th of 1991, which is when Howard and Maria Stark are killed. Very, very important date in the MCU. Uh, they're, of course, killed by the Winter Soldier. Uh, and then in uh, Civil War, we see uh, Tony Stark recreating this scene So we, uh, when they leave, um, which is really sad, a very sad scene. Uh, and there's poor Howard Stark getting pulverized. Oh, and then, of course, Maria Stark. Oh, it's just painful. Uh, and then the reason we know the date is because the newspaper dated on the next day tells us, you know, December 17th, 1991. And, of course, that's yet another actor playing Howard Stark. He's been played by so many different actors. I love it. So then in 1992, Stain is appointed the CEO of Stark Industries, but very soon after, Tony is then appointed the CEO of Stark Industries, and Miss Minutes jumps in to point out another red line alert. She says, howdy y'all, a lot of years from now, a Las Vegas awards ceremony will play a sizzle reel that suggests that Tony Stark didn't take over the family business until he was 21, but if he was already 21 when his parents were killed, what gives? It was a tumultuous time for Stark Industries, and Obadiah Stane took the helm in the interim, so maybe the video glossed over the finer details to keep it dramatic. Of course, she's referring to the scissor reel that was shown in the first Iron Man movie. But yeah, very minor point, but man, it shows they were watching these movies really closely and marking down these dates, so very impressive. All right, so in 1992, T'Chaka confronts N'Jabu regarding Ulysses' claw. Of course, we get the 1992 date in the movie, and of course, um, this results in N'Jabu being killed. Uh, and creates ultimately Killmonger and that whole situation. Uh, summer of 1995, Natasha and Yelena are sent to the Red Room. Oh boy, this is tough stuff. I mean, for the, the beginning of the movie was amazing. The escape, that was awesome. And then you end up uh, seeing them heading off to the Red Room. So, so heartbreaking. Uh, but that's summer of 1995. Also summer of 1995, Captain Marvel battles Jan Rog. Now, I'm obviously, I'm just summarizing an entire movie there. But I'm, in fact, I'm going to be doing that with all the movies. I'm not going to go into every single scene in the movie. That'll take forever. But yeah, the main Captain Marvel movie is happening now. And it's interesting they say summer, although I guess technically June is summer. But obviously the movie shows us uh, that it is June of 1995. So that's cool. Uh, also, and then in summer 1995, they show us, uh, the book tells us that's when Goose hacks up the Tesseract, uh, which was one of the ending scenes. Uh, then, this is not a spoiler, don't worry, because we already knew this happened, but they finally show us in the Marvels how Captain Marvel destroys the Supreme Intelligence, and we don't, that was not in the book, obviously, because uh, it should have been, but, but uh, technically we haven't seen it in the movie until the Marvels, so I'm putting late 1995, because uh, Carol said it was uh, 30 years ago, which would fall around this time, so we'll see where the wiki lands it officially. Uh, 1996, Wenmu meets Ying Li, and they give us the date, 1996, uh, and they do their really cool romantic dance. That was awesome. Uh, then 1996 is when Mark Spector's brother Randall drowns in a cave, and late 1990s is when they say Thanos wipes out half of Gamora's homeworld, and we kind of get an idea of that from um, Infinity War when... Gamora sa or when Thanos says, you told me that you hate me, <laughs> multiple times every day for almost 20 years. So you can kind of do the math and get relatively when this would have happened, but the book chose to go with just late 1990s. Uh, then they don't have the flashback to Mark's 10th birthday, Mark Spector, uh, but that would have been in 1997, so that's why I've done that in red. Um, they obviously do not have Fury dealing with the scrolls. Oh, I, I didn't say it before, sorry, but I'm using green for anything in phase five, because I'm not, 
It's not the book's fault that it didn't include something from phase five, so I don't want to use red unless I feel it's something it truly did leave out. So anyway, we learned in Secret, Secret Invasion that in 1997, Fury strikes a deal with the Scrolls, basically saying, while you work to keep my home safe, Carol Danvers and I will find you a new one. Um, and then we jump to 1998, uh, another flashback in Secret Invasion where Vara and Fury's relationship is off the books. I love their relationship. Secret Invasion was not <laughs> the best show out there, I think we would all agree, but their relationship was so cool. Um, so Vara is saying, our unit doesn't exist, Fury. That means I don't work for you. And then here's Vara handing over Dra uh, information on Drakov's men. And we're going to see, not long from now, is the infamous mission by, the Budapest mission by Black Widow, which I'm sure was helped with this information. All right, so let me go to spring 1999. This was included in the book on Mark's 12th birthday. That's when his mom punishes him severely. And uh, through his trauma, the Stephen Grant persona forms. We go to March 1999, and Wanda and Pietro's parents are killed. Of course, they're sitting there trapped under the rubble and staring at the Stark Industries missile. Ugh, very traumatic. Uh, 1999, Shang-Chi is born. Uh, December of 1999 is the flashback from Iron Man 3, uh, where Tony meets Maya, Yinsen, and Killian. Of course, they give us 1999 there. Uh, there we see uh, Maya uh, and Happy Hogan um, and Yensen, that was very cool, and Killian. Poor dude. They, they have to put in the um, closed captioning that he's stuttering. They made him as geeky as humanly possible. All right, so then the book does not mention, kind of bummed about this, when R.J. Nakajima is killed by the Winter Soldier. Uh, that was a flashback that was very important to the Falcon and the Winter Soldier show. They don't give us any indication when it happens. The book probably just punted on it, but I do like uh, the wiki uh, placing it in 2004, and you can look on the wiki if you want to see why. It's pretty cool uh, how they came up with that. All right, then mid-2000s, Bruce Banner becomes the Hulk. I'm a little surprised they didn't get more clear on this because in the movie, Ross says he made it five years and got across borders without making any mistakes. So it seems pretty clear this is five years before the Hulk movie, but nonetheless, uh, they went with mid-2000s. Um, then 2007, uh, the book mentions that's when y Ying Li is killed, uh, Shang-Chi's mom, and Shang-Chi is then trained to be an assassin, uh, as Katie says, your dad trained you to be an assassin when you were seven. Uh, then uh, in green, because I would not expect these to be in the book, but we get the flashbacks to Rocket and his life. Now, I did a really detailed video uh, on Guardians 3 time plane placement where I explain where I came up with 2007, or I should really say with the help of the wiki team because they did all the amazing research. Love the wiki. But nonetheless, I'm not going to go into it here other than just to say it does look at things like the life expectancy of raccoons and when we see Rocket Raccoon first appear, etc. But this cool image on the left is uh, was posted by James Gunn and it was all the different stages of Rocket's life. And we're going to kind of see those in the flashbacks. We see when he's a little baby Rocket and the hand reaching in. Uh, we see Rocket then being experimented upon, stitch him up and transfer him in with the rest of Batch 89. We see him then thrown back in the cage, obviously, and we'll come back to him. Uh, but now we got to jump to Maya Lopez for the moment, which strangely, this was not included in the book. Now, there's been some things I thought, eh, if they didn't include it, not a big deal, but this is really important. I'm very surprised this one was not included, but nonetheless, we know it's 2007 because they tell us that. And of course, uh, she's doing her karate practice and we meet her uncle. And this scene is going to be very important in the Echo series coming up because they're going to have more flashbacks to this time frame. In fact, supposedly there, were, there was more filmed. There was a deleted scene. We might actually be seeing some of that. So we'll see. All right, so then back to Rocket. Now Rocket is a little older and is playing with his friends, and he's being taught by the High Evolutionary. The High Evolutionary mentions that our training is halfway there. Um, then Rocket helps solve the issue with Batch 90. Remember, he was Batch uh, 89, but helps solve the issue with uh, Batch 90 and dreams with his friends about uh, heading out. Uh, then we get to the 2000s, they're not real specific again, but Black Widow's infamous Budapest operation, where of course he, uh, she thought uh, she killed Drakov's daughter, turns out she didn't, as we find out in the movie. But I'm a little surprised too that they didn't use the information from a deleted scene, which granted isn't canon necessarily, but notice um, Yelena is saying, you drove us into a cage, and uh, Natasha says, well the gate wasn't here eight years ago. So if the movie came out in 2016, theoretically this would be 2008, but nonetheless, they went with 2000s, so so be it. 
Um, then early 2008, we're now finally into what would be the main MCU, the first Iron Man movie. So they tell us it's early, I think it's probably February, Iron Man is captured by the Ten Rings. Uh, then we jump to Iron Man returning from captivity, and he says he's been there for three months, so now the timeline books moves us to spring of 2008. And then there is a date given in the movie, May 4th of 2008, so that codifies the 2008, um, and still putting us in spring. And then the, the book basically says the rest of the movie all happens is still in the springtime. So the, the Mark III in action, the infamous I Am Iron Man, and of course the Nick Fury post credit scene. And then we get a flashback in Far From Home, but to the Iron Man movie. So I'm just making mention of it here because we see uh, poor William Ginter Riva being chewed out by Stain for the fact that Stark could figure all this out and he was in a cave with a box of scraps. You know, and of course, poor William couldn't figure things out. So yeah, I, lo I love this flashback from Far From Home all the way back to the first Iron Man movie. Very cool. Then the way that they handle the time span between Iron Man and Iron Man 2 is basically saying it's spring of 2008 when Whiplash's father, Anton, dies, right? It's because they're watching him say, literally, I am Iron Man on the TV as his father dies. Then they're saying from 2008 all the way to 2010, Whiplash plots his revenge and builds a suit. And if you think about it, they do show us a lot of scenes uh, through these credits. You know, Iron Man becoming person of the year, uh, Iron Man stabilizing east-west relations. So I do think when the movie was made, they were assuming this was only six months apart. But I can also agree that you could interpret it that there was a lot of time here. And we're, we're going to come back to this again. But it's very important to, to note that they're, they're saying basically a year and a half transpires from the end of Iron Man 1 to the beginning of Iron Man 2. Uh, and of course, that's when, when Whiplash uh, finally gets his suit working. All right, so back to the final uh, rocket uh, flashbacks. Uh, the High Evolutionary is now working on Batch 92. I think that's in 2008. Uh, rocket learns they're all going to be killed when he says Batch 89 was never meant for the New World, P-13. And so Rocket decides that's it. They're going to kill us all in the morning, and they make their escape. Well, they try to because his friends, of course, are tragically killed. Ugh, a tough scene. Uh, then we also learn in 2009, that's when the Black Widow encountered the Winter Soldier. Remember, she was shot in the side and said, you know, no more bikinis for me. Um, but it's interesting because this is not long after the Budapest mission. That was in 2008, probably, is what I'm guessing. So just one year later, she gets shot. But she joins S.H.I.E.L.D. and boom, gets shot with one, with it just, you know, 20, 365 days later. Crazy. Then we get to another one of the flashbacks that I'm putting in green because it's from Phase 5. Would not have expected this to be in the book. But this is when I believe Kang arrives in the quantum realm with Janet. Notice, uh, he, or she says, but after so many years alone, it was nice to have a friend. And Peyton Reed, in an interview, said that he's announcing early on that this is going to be a very different tone for the Ant-Man movies. We designed the idea that somewhere, say 21 to 22 years, into Janet's 30 years down there, she'd given up hope, right? So if you go with 22, then if she went in 1987, you're at 2009. So, okay, cool. The book then says in 2009, that's when the extremist breakthrough begins, and we start seeing all the deaths, which is going to play into Iron Man 3. In spring of 2010, we catch up with Bruce, who is hiding out in Rio de Janeiro and has gone 158 days without an incident. So again, if this is 2010 and he's been on the run for five years, I don't know why they couldn't have just gone with 2005, but anyway, that's all right. Um, and then, of course, Bruce's blood gets into a soda bottle, which <laughs> kills Stan Lee, although theoretically it doesn't kill him, right? Because he ends up being the watcher through all those different movies, so it probably just made him really sick and then he miraculously recovered, I guess. <laughs> but anyway, now, finally, we've moved to spring of 2010. So again, year and a half after the first movie, um, and then we jump six months later. So this six months later, the way the book is interpreting it, is six months from the point when Anton finished building the suit. Very interesting. And that leads to the Stark Expo, which at least in, in uh, behind-the-scenes promotional websites, they do canonize as 2010, so that's why they picked 2010 for the book. And then this line is interesting. Justin Hammer says, We all know why we're here. In the last six months, Anthony Stark has created a sword of unto untold possibilities. So my guess is, the book doesn't explain it. I wish, I wish a little um, Miss Minutes would have popped up to explain this one, but I'm guessing they're referring to something that happened just six months ago 
for example, maybe when he got world peace in the Mideast. You know, that was a pretty big deal. So anyway, this line doesn't work perfectly, so I'm just pointing it out, but it is what it is. Phase one was retconned so many times. Speaking of retcons, this line has to be retconned, where uh, Justin Hammer says, she's actually doing a big, big spread on me in Vanity Fair. And Pepper jumps in with the burn and says, well, she did quite a spread on Tony last year. Well, last year would be 2009, not 2008. So clearly, you just have to accept that Pepper forgot what year. She was so excited about burning um, um, and poor Christina Everhart that she forgot what year it happened. All right, so then they give us a specific date, May 5th of 2010, for the Monaco Grand Prix. And you might say, why, why did they do that? Uh, of course, that's when uh, Whiplash attacks. Well, because actually there is a date in the movie on the next day of 5-6-2010. Now, the weird thing is May 5th, if you look at that date in, on, on a calendar, is a Wednesday. So I guess we're saying that the Grand Prix rained out multiple days in a row and ended up on a Wednesday? I don't know. Anyway, it is what it is, right? Um, all right, so then uh, we then have, now we're moving into Fury's Big Week at this point because now they found where Banner is in that bottle factory because of poor Stanley getting sick and Blonsky goes after him. And now we know this is, uh, at this point, the, the 190 days without incident turns to zero. So we know it's been 190 days at this point. Uh, then spring of 2010, Hammer hires Vanko, you know, fakes his death and hires him to work on the robots. Um, then in, also in spring of 2010, Thor's, um, coronation is canceled in Asgard. And in spring of 2010, Tony celebrates his birthday, which you have to kind of assume if they went with that May 6th date, then he's celebrating his birthday early because this would not be many days after that. So his birthday, if it's May, if it is May 29th, which I think it is, that's really cool to have it be then. He's just celebrating early. Uh, then of course he fights Rhodey that night. Uh, then in the morning, Rhodes turns the armor uh, into the war machine armor, and Fury visits Stark and provides a temporary cure for his ailment. Uh, then that night, Thor leads the attack on the Frost Giants, and Thor is, because he did that, Thor is then banished to Earth. Um, meanwhile, um, uh, Coulson, sorry, is uh, leaves... Um, uh, Stark's side uh, so that Stark can fit, find the permanent cure, which of course he finds on that video of his dad that he eventually watches. Uh, that's the night that I, everything, all hell breaks loose. The widow makes her move. Love that scene where she takes everybody down. Uh, and of course we have the final Stark Expo battle uh, versus um, Veko and all of the different suits of armor. And then, very strange, it's the only one shot not included in the book. I guess they figured it wasn't important enough it's Coulson, man. You got to include Coulson. So at this point, is Coulson has left Stark's side. So this would be when he stops the robbery in the funny thing happened on the way to Thor's hammer one shot. Then we now see Bruce showing up in Culver University. It's been 17 days since we last saw him because days without incident are 17. That night, Thor tries to retrieve his hammer unsuccessfully. Uh, also, Blonsky gets his first dose of the super soldier serum mixture. Uh, then we have Thor battling the Destroyer. Isn't it crazy? All this stuff going on at once. Uh, we have Thor fighting Loki in Asgard. Uh, we have Hulk, um, uh, or Banner hulking out, if you will, at Colville University. We have Stark watching uh, Banner hulk out on live news in a feed while he's talking to Fury. Uh, then we have uh, Banner waking up in a cave the next uh, day after a night in the cave. And then this is kind of funny. So Miss Minutes, man, she's watching close. So when Banner reaches out to Mr. Blue, notice the date down there. It's very hard to read, but it's 6-12 of 08, even though the movie is in 2010, right? And then they also point out we get this date of March 7th. Now, I don't have an issue with this. This could have just been written, these rules of engagement could have been written in advance of going to attack him. So I don't have an issue with them being in 2007, but Miss Minutes does. She jumps in and says, y'all might have noticed that the email Bruce Banner sends to Stearns is dated June 12, 2008, and the military orders sent to email Bonsky are dated 2007, but all this happens in 2010. This disruption in the timeline is the is a one the TVA will have to investigate. Lickety split. So she's so snarky, uh, it, which is funny. Again, she's ripping on Marvel and its own continuity issues. So you got to love it. Uh, all right, so then we finally have the battle in Harlem between Hulk and uh, Abomination. Then he goes 31 more days without incident. 
and then has learned to control it. Zero days without incident, but that's because now he knows how to gain control of his transformations. Very cool. So, whew, that was Fury's big week. But again, I have a, I have a video that goes if you can believe it, into even more detail, like going down to how you would s synchronize the movies down to the minute, if you want to watch that sometime. All right, so then we move to summer of 2010 when Stark is the consultant, which of course is the consultant one shot. Now, what if I told you we were putting a team together? And he was sent to, of course, tank uh, the, the negotiations with Ross by Sitwell and Coulson. Uh, and then this is kind of fun. For once, her snark is interesting. <laughs> so <laughs> Miss Minute says, wowie, you ever think about the impact of a single moment in time? The World Security Council wanted to make Emo Blonsky a public hero and an Avenger, leaving the sole blame for Harlem's damage on the Hulk. Instead of a beloved superhero in the Battle of New York, Emil went to prison for 15 years. Just think, what if? So maybe we're going to get a what if, where Abomination is the hero and Hulk goes to jail. Interesting. Anyway, 2011 is when Ross suffers his heart attack playing golf. He mentions that in Civil War. 2011 is also when Steve Rogers' shield and frozen body are finally recovered. And, of course, uh, Captain America uh, is told that he was frozen for nearly 70 years by Nick Fury, which that basically works. This one works less well. Uh, in Homecoming, uh, Captain Amer they mentioned Captain America was frozen on ice for 65 years. Take it from a guy who's been frozen for 65 years. That math doesn't work as well, but we all know Homecoming had a few issues, right, with dates. <laughs> um, so then they mentioned from 2010 to 2012 is Loki's Revenge. And man, look at him there. I, I know it's not officially canon, but uh, on the Marvel website, marvel.com website, they say that he was to some extent controlled by the Mind Stone and it brought out his anger to make him even more vicious and crazy. So it's, he was in control. He wanted to, to, to attack New York, but he, his, his emotions were personified by the Mind Stone. Because yeah, look at that face. Well, man, he is nuts. Anyway, uh, now we get to uh, the actual Avengers movie, which I'm summarizing as Avengers Battle Loki, but you get the idea. So the main Avengers movie occurs. Uh, of course, we get the Thanos uh, post credit scene uh, and the, um, the epic um, uh, scene of them all eating shawarma together. Uh, then, just to prove that it's 2012, obviously the book went with 2012, but multiple movies refer to it as 2012. The movie itself gives us actually May, so I'm surprised they went with spring because we get May 4th in this case. Also in the Loki series, we get May 4th, 2012, and even in Endgame, we get a May of 2012. So this is one of the most uh, established uh, dates for any movie in the MCU, but still, they went with spring, which is accurate. All right, so then uh, just a couple points that this works really well when um, Natasha says, you've been more than a year without an incident to Hulk, and it was more than a year because it's two years ago since Fury's big week. However, this line doesn't work as well when Fury says last year Earth had a visitor from another planet, which would make Thor in 2011, but of course it's really in 2010. So I'm a little surprised Miss Minutes didn't have something to say about this, but it's just been retconned. Uh, Fury was off. He was, he was having a bad day and should have said two years. Uh, so then in spring of 2012 during the Avengers, it's also worth noting that it seems that Barack Obama is president. And I say that because his press secretary in real life is Jay Carney, who appears in the movie. I'm bringing that up more so because um, we're gonna talk about Ellis when we get to Iron Man 3. But it does seem like um, uh, Barack Obama is president at this point. All right, so spring of 2012 also, the Avengers movie. We see the flashback in Hawkeye where Kate Bishop is watching Hawkeye in battle. That's a really cool shot. That's his arm and the arrow, and she's standing there in the window uh, idolizing him and wanting to become an archer herself. Also, we get another flashback to this infamous battle with the Ancient One. Uh, this is in Endgame when they do the time heist. We learn that she was helping with the battle. I thought that was really cool. Uh, we also learn in Endgame during the time heist about the strike team, and they're the ones that came and got Loki's scepter. So uh, Black Widow saying, uh, who gets the magic wand? And it's the strike team coming for it, um, and, and they take it ultimately to Dr. List, who, which, of course, we see in uh, Age of Ultron. So that was really cool. I love how they kind of tied that little piece in. Uh, then we see Pierce wanting Loki and the Tesseract. He's saying, may I ask you where you're going? Turn that prisoner over to me, of course, being Loki, but also the Tesseract has been shield property for over 70 years, which that fits. That's correct. Because remember, they retrieved it um, not long after uh, Captain America uh, went on the ice. 
Uh, then, uh, finally, that's it, that's it for uh, Avengers. So then we have the item 47 one-shot, which the book places in spring of 2012. And notice these lines fit really well that it's very soon after the Avengers movie. Richmond, Virginia, seven days after the Battle of New York, they use the weapon. Greensboro, North Carolina, two days after that. Charleston, South Carolina, the following afternoon. And then Savannah, Georgia, yesterday morning. So if you add all that together, you know, we're literally talking about maybe a week and a half after the Avengers movie. Uh, and then, of course, we get the post credit scene where um, both of them get invited to become S.H.I.E.L.D. recruits, which theoretically was a pilot for the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. series, but neither of the two showed up in it. It's kind of odd. All right, so then we get uh, Damage Control taking over the cleanup, this flashback from uh, Homecoming with uh, Damage Control basically telling Adrian Toomes, you'll hit the road. So yeah, and, and created a supervillain out of it. Uh, then uh, some more green flashbacks, because these are from phase five, but soon after uh, the Avengers battle in 2012, VAR discovers that Fury formed the Avengers team. Because she says, as I was watching all the news coverage of those guys, uh, heroics over in the States, strangest thing, I kept having this feeling that I know that someone I know had something to do with getting them all together. So that's pretty cool. We see their relationship again continuing to blossom as she says, to call myself beloved, to feel myself beloved on the earth, which is a real important line throughout the series. Again, series wasn't that great, but their relationship was. All right, so then we get a flashback um, in uh, Thor the Dark World or whether you want to call it a flashback or a, it is essentially a flashback to Loki being taken to Asgard. So on the left, you see him in chains in Avengers. And on the right, you see him being taken straight up uh, and, and imprisoned. All right, then I wish they would have included this in the book. I don't know why they didn't. Uh, surely around this time would have been when Captain America made those PSAs, public service announcements that he did, that we saw in Homecoming, which were epic. So I'm putting 2012 and assuming it's right around this time frame. Also, the book alludes to it, but doesn't specifically say uh, when, in, uh, when you know, uh, Scott Lang redistributes Vista Corp's wealth. If you remember, he did that robbery and got himself arrested and then spends three years in jail. So we know it's in 2012. Seems like it'd be around this point in time. Um, so yeah, I was a little surprised that wasn't mentioned. And then we also get to meet uh, Scott's cellmate, Luis, in a flashback in Ant-Man and the Wasp, where Luis is telling one of his crazy stories. He says, because when I first met Scotty, he was in a bad place. His wife had just filed for divorce, and I was like, dang, homie, she dumped you while you're on lockup? So I, lo I love that flashback, because we get to see when they first met, and we also get to see that epic haircut, <laughs> hairstyle of, uh, of Luis's there. All right, so then another flashback that uh, is from um, uh, Phase 5. This, I think, is when Janet finally fixes the multiversal core engine. It's hard to see and, and to tell exactly how much time they were working on it. She says it took ages. So, okay, I'll make it three years, because remember I said it was 2009 when they first met, so it took them several years to work on it. Um, and then after she sabotages the core, she's on the run the rest of the time until they finally rescue her. So it'll be interesting to see where the timeline book ultimately places this, but I'm just putting it in here at least so you get an idea and you can decide in your mind when you think it occurs. Because she then sent, I, uh, says, I spent years fighting him, running from him, hiding from him. All right, so then we move to Thor the Dark World, which I'm summarizing as Thor Battles Malekith. <laughs> but yeah, basically this is when the movie occurs. We know it's in 2013, because of many reasons. During the time heist, they go back to 2013. There's also a calendar in the movie that shows 2013. And um, Dr. Selvik, after his little streaking incident, uh, is released on 11 14 of 2013. So, yeah, it's clearly November of 2013. And uh, this kind of works. This line is interesting. She says the last time he, Thor, was gone for like two years. So Darcy's trying to comfort poor Jane about whether Thor will come back. So the question is, two years, what, what would that have been? I'm assuming she's now referring to, to the Avengers movie in 2012. You wonder if originally they were assuming that the, the first Thor movie happened in 2011 and be, the, the two years would be the first Thor movie. But hey, this still works. The line still works. She's referring to Avengers in this case. Uh, then, this is funny, Miss Minutes jumps in with a very interesting comment. She says, well, hey there, before being released from treatment on November 11th, 2013, a disoriented Dr. Selvig scribbles the convergence on a chalkboard and underlines the phrase 616 universe. Leave it to Dr. Selvig to be ahead of the curve. 
So again, I'm not going to get into the debate, but Miss Minutes clearly believes at least the sacred timeline is 616. So anyway, uh, then also there is a, another flashback uh, in during the, the time heist where we actually see Jane Foster in a deleted scene from Thor The Dark World now being used in Avengers Endgame, but that's when they suck the ether out of her. So that's kind of cool. Then finally, uh, back to the regular Thor movie, we see that this is where the end credit scene occurs, where they give the reality stone to the collector. Uh, so I like the fact that for the most part, all the post credit scenes are included in the book. There's a few you'll see that aren't, but most of them are. Then they basically say from 2012, so the Avengers movie, up to Iron Man 3, uh, so 2012 to 2013, Tony is building the Iron Legion armor. And I do like them moving it to December of 2013 for this reason only, in that I think it would have taken him a long time to build those suits of armor. But again, I do have a separate video because I know there are people that are not going to like this placement of December 2013, and I totally understand why. So check out the video if you want more. But this is uh, Iron Man 3 when Tony fights the Mandarin. And... Uh, uh, all kinds of craziness occurs. Obviously, Christmas time, as you can see with Killian. Then, yeah, this is one reason why people don't like 2013 for what it's worth. The prelude is in New Year's Eve of 1999, and then Killian mentions that the movie is happening 13 years ago, or that prelude is 13 years ago. So that would seem to be 2012, but clearly he must just be uh, adding it to New Year's Day, which was 2000 plus 13 is 2013. So it works. It works. Tony Stark then again mentions it was 13 years ago. He then talks about having a kid that would be 12 years old, which gestation period of him uh, being born, the kid being born, that would why he would be 12. This is interesting though, because Maya then jokes and says, no, 13. So actually, if Maya's correct that he should be 13, then it actually is December of 2013. Isn't that funny? Um, but the, the real reason they go with uh, December 2013 is you can see the newspaper here, and if we zoom in, yeah, December 23rd of 2013. So, okay, so be it. Um, but one reason I really like it being December of 2013 is that moves Matthew Ellis' presidency into 2013 instead of being in 2012, because if it's in December 2012, he's overlapping with, I guess, Obama's. So now this can make him officially president from 2013 to 2016. Then we move to early 2014, which is when Tony has the shrapnel removed, uh, finally, after all this time, uh, so that it will no longer be a threat to his heart. Uh, then they don't necessarily have this post-credit scene, so I'm, I'm making it in red, but presumably it's soon after that that Tony retells uh, basically the entire movie of Iron Man 3 to Bruce while he's napping. <laughs> Are you still with me? Oh yeah, sorry, sorry, I was. Yeah, yeah, no, you were sleeping, dude. You were totally sleeping. Uh, then early 2014 is when Trevor is captured by Wen Wu. That's the All Hell the King one shot, which is interesting because I thought he was in prison for a while. I thought it would take time for him to, you know, get his posse and such. And it could still be a month, or two months, etc. But it isn't long. And of course, we get those end credit scenes that are epic with Justin Hammer um, and his new uh, friend, <laughs> which, by the way, is the first same-sex uh, couple <laughs> in the MCU. So you got to love that, right? Go Justin Hammer. Uh, all right, so 2014, Shang-Chi is turned into a killer uh, before ultimately leaving his father. Uh, he says, by the time I was 14, I could barely remember what life was like uh, before she died, uh, before his mom died. Uh, and then his dad is saying, then I gave you 10 years to live your life. So basically 10 years after 2014 is when the movie itself occurs in 2024. So that works perfectly. Uh, spring of 2014 is when uh, Hydra falls. And of course, Bucky returns as a Winter Soldier. So the Winter Soldier movie occurs. Um, and in that movie, Steve Rogers jokes about being uh, 95 years old, but I'm not dead. And so you can do that math with when he joined uh, or, sorry, do that math with when his birthday is, which is July 1918, and you get a nice 2014 placement. And also now we officially know that is a four down there. Uh, you know, we couldn't really tell because the stupid flowers were in the way, but it sure looked like the peak of a four. And yes, now we know it is spring of 2014. So soon after that, Wanda is exposed to the Mind Stone, uh, which we get these flashbacks from um, WandaVision. And there, there you can see the Scarlet Witch reflecting in her eye there. That's pretty cool. And then we also get this post-credit scene where they continue using the Mind Stone on them and continue experimenting. So then we get find out that in spring of 2014 is when Ava Starr turns to Bill Foster for help. 
so remember it was quite a while ago where she got uh, injured and damaged uh, by by the quantum uh, particles, and then she's needed um, Shields assistance for a long time, but then now has turned, of course, to Bo Foster. And Spring of 14 is also when Bucky visits the Smithsonian Institute. That's the post credit scene to Winter Soldier. Then we have 2014, uh, Summer, which is when the Guardians battle Ronan. And, of course, we get the Howard the Duck. Had to include him. Uh, but epic first Guardians movie. Um, and we know it's that because uh, the flashback says Earth of 1988, and then we add 26 years later, and so that's how we get the 2014. And in Endgame, they go back to 2014. So they really codify this 2014 date. And then we get a little bit of behind the scenes about what Gamora and Nebula and Thanos are up to, because in the time heist, we, of course, learn more about what's happening in 2014 when they go back to get the Power Stone. And we learn that Nebula and Gamora are worried about Father's plan being finally in motion, and if he gets all of them, of course, referring to the stones, and then in walks Thanos, who says, Ronan's located the Power Stone, and I'm dispatching you to his ship. So those are the scenes that happen basically right before the formal part of the movie happens with uh, Star-Lord getting the Power Stone. That's kind of cool. And then also because Black Widow and uh, Hawkeye go back in time to 2014 to Vormir, we find out that, and we knew this was the case, but Red Skull is indeed sitting on the planet waiting to see anybody who wants to try to get the Soul Stone. All right, so then we get the end credit scene uh, with the <laughs> dancing Groot in the pot, and we get the first episode of I Am Groot happening. So the book mentions those. Uh, then we go to uh, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, where the Guardians battle Ego, obviously, and that's fall of 2014, uh, in which we know that because in the movie it says 1980 and then jumps forward 34 years, so very cool. We also get the end credit scene happening at this point, so the book uh, canonizes that it's in fall of 2014 that Aisha starts plotting her revenge. So, yeah, it took her a while, because we're going to see that Guardians 3 is in 2026, so... Goodness gracious, 12 years. So wild, very wild. Interestingly enough, though, they do not include these three post credit scenes. Oh, the Stan Lee one. Come on, guys, you got to include that. Uh, so I'm still thinking, though, they all happen right after the movie, so fall of 2014. But anyway, they're not specifically mentioned in the timeline book. Uh, then, though, the timeline book does mention uh, the rest of Baby Groot's adventures from season one. Of course, the timeline book doesn't mention season two because that came out during phase five, even though, of course, it happens in fall of 2014. Then we move to something that's kind of controversial and I covered in depth in my Thor Love and Thunder video, but the book says from 2013 all the way to 2017, Thor and Jane are dating. So it doesn't like tell you any of the dates. I put these in just kind of guessing at it because I think it kind of makes sense. Like, for example, we know Halloween is when they dressed up like the hot dog and stuff, and he made the the uh, the special request of Mjolnir to protect Jane. But the reason I'm breaking it there at March 2015 is because in Age of Ultron, uh, that's the same time when Jane is getting recognition in the magazines and uh, Thor is bragging about her, saying her work on the Convergence has made her the world's foremost astronomer, and there's even talk of her getting the Nobel Peace Prize. So the real key is their dating is going well at this point. It then will start to go downhill when we pick up uh, on the dating again uh, down the road. Okay, so then we have Age of Ultron, and of course they battle, uh, no surprise, Ultron, right? So this is when the main part of the movie happens. Note that they say that at this point, four Infinity Stones have shown up, so I'm assuming that Thor became aware of the Power Stone maybe when he took that, that weird bath and got the knowledge. But so four of the stones are out there now, uh, and he takes off to go search for the stones. But I do believe, uh, and, and, the, and the timeline book canonizes, that he did come back for several more dates after this point. He's gone for a while, but then he does eventually return. So then this is interesting. In Civil War, Tony Stark mentions that Charlie Spencer is a student who dies in Sokovia, and that he decided to spend his summer there. So he's implying there that Age of Ultron starts maybe at the beginning of summer, but of course this kid could have gone a little bit before summer started, so it's still spring of 2015, but just kind of interesting. Uh, so then the, the timeline book mentions from 2015 to 2016 are when Vision and Wanda became, let's say, more than friends. They started, their relationship started to blossom. Summer of 2015 is when Scott defeats Yellow Jacket and saves Cassie. So basically the movie occurs at this point. And we have a good idea of the fact that it's around the July time frame because uh, there's a tweet from WHIH Newsfront uh, talking about they got a hold of the 2012 break-in at Vistacorp. And of course, they were releasing that because Scott was about to get out of jail. So that works. Summer of 2015, 
Uh, Scott says he's been in prison for three years, because remember, he's been uh, ever since that 2012 heist that went amok. Uh, then, giving a hint as to how long the movie transpires, they're talking about having cash ready within just a few weeks. So, really, once the main movie gets rolling, it goes fast. It is in a very short span of time. So, even though there is this phone image seeming to imply October, which is pretty blurry, but still, you can see October there, the, the, the timeline book canonizes that it all takes place in the summer of 2015. Uh, then they also show us the post credit scene where a wasp gets her costume is in summer of 2015. Then this is kind of cool. Doctor Strange is a very long-spanning movie. So they tell us in early 2016 is when Kaecilis begins his forbidden rituals. Then in early 2016 is when Doctor Strange would have received his award, because notice it's dated 2016. And then we know the specific date of his car crash because his watch says February 2nd of 2016. So then... His story stops for the moment, and remember, now he's injured and is trying very much to, to fix his injuries. That's going to happen for quite a while, so we'll pick up on that soon. Then in spring of 2016, that's the superhero Civil War erupts, and unfortunately, the movie does not answer an age-old question, which is, does the movie go from March to April, or does it go from May to June? I say there's two different options because, notice this newspaper says March, and then a little bit later, Stan Lee, RIP buddy, uh, has a FedEx box dated April. So the movie could be from March to April, or there's a tweet from WHH Newsfront in May, and then of course it jumps another month because uh, they say the battle in La uh, Lagos, Nigeria was last month. So that's still up in the air. I personally think it's May to June because that fits better with when all the other movies now pick up. But so be it. Uh, we don't know. So spring of 2016, uh, we also get the flashback of um, Quentin Beck watching Tony reveal the barf tech. And he's standing there going, are you kidding me? A, why did you call it barf? And B, this is how you're using it? And remember, he plots his revenge against Stark in Far From Home. So the Far From Home flashbacks happen at this point. Then we get several references back to other movies. First, they reference back to Iron Man, which was eight years ago, and Vision says eight years since Mr. Stark announced himself as Iron Man. Uh, Ross then basically places his heart attack five years previous, so that would have been after the Incredible Hulk movie. Four, it's four years after Avengers, because he says for the past four years, you've operated with unlimited power. It's two years after Winter Soldier, because they say, aren't you the same woman who told the government to kiss her butt a few years ago? And also they say, Steve, we looked for the guy, meaning Bucky, for two years. Uh, and then it's one year after Age of Ultron, because he says, I've thought about nothing else for over a year. So yeah, pretty cool that Civil War ties back to so many other movies. Now, interestingly, they don't show where the beginning of Homecoming fits in, because remember in Homecoming, we see uh, the awkward hug, which wasn't a hug, he was opening the door, um, and then Peter getting home and then turning on his little um, device and learning about his uh, spider signal. Yeah, I didn't mention those, and those are minor things, but still, we know, they're, we know they're right after Civil War ends. Also, they do mention this, this is really helpful, right after Civil War ends, Bucky is taken for therapy in Wakanda. In fact, this is even before everyone was rescued off the raft. So Steve takes care of Bucky first before getting people out of prison. That's interesting. So we go straight then into the Black Widow movie, spring to summer, notice they say, of 2016, when Natasha battles Drakoff, and we know it's 21 years after 1995. Then, as soon as the Black Widow movie is over, we jump to the Black Panther movie when T'Challa battles Killmonger. And we know that that's only a week after Civil War because they're talking about it at the United Nations a week ago, his father died. So this is all, stuff is really tight. Uh, then they tell us this is when T'Challa addresses the United Nations. So we now know that that is very soon after the Black Panther movie. Then, two weeks after the Black Widow movie ends, now it's time to go rescue everyone off the raft. So, yeah, they were on there for a good couple weeks. <laughs> anyway, wild. Uh, and notice uh, Black Widow is saying, I'm going to go break a few, a few of them out of prison. And, of course, Tony gets the call from Ross that there's been a breach at the raft prison. All right, so then we move to fall of 2016, where the main part of Homecoming takes place, Spider-Man battling the Vulture. And we get that it's two months after Civil War, and they pretty well uh, tell us that it is September, in fact, September 14th. Well, they sort of tell us that because there's another poster that says October. And oh, you know who's going to talk about that, right? Yep, Miss Minnis jumps in and says, Howdy, maybe you all noticed a poster for the academic decathlon hanging in Midtown School that says Washington, D.C. event is in October, while another poster in Peter Parker's bedroom says it's in September. 
I'm going to ask someone about this, but everyone's on their pie break at the moment. Their pie break. Epic. Uh, but yeah, that was clearly a mistake. But that's not the only one. Oh yeah, remember, we have the eight years later, and she doesn't have much to say on this. Hi again. Adrian Toomes says the Battle of New York was eight years ago, but that event was only four years prior. This one's a real head scratcher for us. I reckon an analyst misplaced the case file. Oh, but that's not it. Then she points out that Aaron Davis is said to be 33, but notice she says Peter Parker asked the Karen AI to run a facial recognition scan on the buyer he saw on the bridge during Liz's party. Karen identifies Aaron Davis as age 33, but calls up a file that says his birthday is April 19th of 1984, which would make him only 32. Mm Mm-hmm. With date entry, you never never can tell which input was right. Then she points out, (laughs) this is the fourth error in the movie. Four. Anyway, she points out, Hiya, was that Tony Stark's Mark uh, XLII suit on the cargo plane headed for the Avengers compound? That's mighty strange considering Tony blew it up while fighting Aldrich Killian. If he rebuilt it, that plane crash just means he'll have to build it again. Golly. (laughs) Ouch. Four errors in Homecoming. Goodness gracious. Anyway, they do get this right, though, because Iron Man is now in 2008, so the fact that he says, I've been carrying this ring since 2008 works perfectly. Then we get the uh, end credit scene of Tombs protecting Peter's identity, so that's cool. Um, Then we finally get now back to Doctor Strange. So basically, from uh, February all the way to fall of 2016, February to fall, he's searching for answers and spending all his money. I mean, I knew it was a while, but I thought this was really interesting insight into the movie. So yeah, months and months he does. So finally then he goes to Comertage and trains in the mystic arts. The Ancient One dies in, I'm assuming, early 2017, but they just say 2017. And then in 2017, Doctor Strange battles Dormammu. All right, this all fits really well because during the time heist, when they go back to 2012, the Ancient One basically says, you're about five years too early to seeing uh, Doctor Strange. Well, that works well because that was May of 2012, and this is kind of like you know January, February of 2017. So that works perfectly. All right, they do not have when this end credit scene happens. I'm kind of bummed. I was really wanting to know when Mordo started searching for you know the too many sorcerers. He does say, I've been away for many months now, and I've had a revelation. So we know it's well into 2017. But then, of course, he says the infamous too many sorcerers. So really, really interesting they didn't have this one. So then we get to the second part of Thor and Jane's uh, dating montage, i.e. the breakup. And granted, the book, again, just says it's from 2013 to 2017 that all this happens. But I think there's a natural break here because Thor's now been off looking for the stones. He comes back, and their relationship has fallen apart, as you can tell from the images. He finally gets the note in March of 2017, and that works perfectly. Then in October of 2025, he will say that it was eight years, seven months, and six days ago that they broke up. It works well because he's gone during Civil War, which is in spring of 2016. Do you know where Thor and Banner are right now, says Ross. So that's perfect. Uh, And also Doctor Strange in the fall of 2017, uh, when Ragnarok happens, he couldn't even get a hold of Thor. He says, I I guess you don't have a phone, right? No, it's funny because we do see he had a phone at one point when Nick Furry called him. But clearly by now he's ditched the phone when he went searching for the stones. All right, so finally now we get to Ragnarok, which again has that Doctor Strange appearance, Thor fighting Hulk, and of course the Revengers teaming up, and that's in fall of 2017 when they fight Hela. Then also in fall of 2017, it, uh, to me this works really good if they broke up in March because here in the fall is when someone's reminding him, hey, sorry, Jane dumped you. So it kind of puts the, the breakup and then the dumpage comment <laughs> being relatively close to each other. Then uh, we also get the reference to Age of Ultron being two years ago, which that works perfectly. And we get another reference to it being two years ago. Maybe the fact that I was trapped for two years as the Hulk. So that's perfect because that was two years ago. And then we get the timeline book telling us when the Grandmaster declares it's a tie. So the post credit scene to Ragnarok. Then we move to spring of 2018 for Ant-Man fighting the ghost and, of course, rescuing Janet from the Quantum Realm. So the Ant-Man and the Wasp movie. And uh, it's been said that Scott's been on home detention for two years, provided he served two years under house arrest. So that works in spring of 2018. Uh, And of course, Scott's saying, are my two years up already? So clearly it's been the full two years. Then his laptop gives us a date, I think, of 4-30-2018. If we zoom in, I don't know. Can you read that? But that would fit with spring of 2018. So that's good. Now, I wish the timeline book, I really wish they had mentioned when this post credit scene from Age of Ultron happens, where Thanos says, uh, it's time to do it myself, right? 
I think it's right before Infinity War. I just don't like it any earlier than that. So that's where I'm putting it. Um, but yeah, I really wish they would tell us officially when it happened because this would mean he now immediately goes searching for the Power Stone and seizes it from Xandar in, a, in um, the, the scene that supposedly was filmed but, but uh, then deleted. So I hope we get to see that sometime. Uh, then also, right before he shows up uh, on Earth, we have uh, Shuri finishing Bucky's conditioning. Now, I have this one read because this scene isn't in the book, but what is in the book is the mention to when he meets with Ao and you know cries of joy because he's able to finally be free. So it's hard to tell how long Shuri was working on him and how long Ao was working on him, really is my point. I don't know when this scene of him walking out from uh, Shuri curing him took place in relation to when uh, meeting with Ao and her helping him through it all took place. We just know it ended six years before Falcon and the Winter Soldier. All right, so we don't unfortunately get this particular uh, post credit scene with Teenage Groot, but I'm placing it here. Uh, we also don't get this uh, post credit scene with Thanos' uh, ship approaching Thor's ship, but it's pretty clear that it's right around this time frame. Uh, then, of course, we get uh, Infinity War where Thanos wins in spring of 2018. Uh, that, that obviously is in the book. <laughs> uh, and we know it's 2018 because Hawkeye does a flashback to some of the blips and gives us that year. Miss Marvel has a really cool Easter egg that if you zoom in, you can see spring of 2018 uh, showing us when this happened. That's really cool. Uh, they reference it six years after Avengers because Thanos has been in my head for six years. It's been two years since Civil War because Vision and Wanda have been uh, on the run, and they've stolen these moments together, so that's cool. It's been two years after Civil War because <laughs> Rhodey says, wow, you guys really look like crap. Must have been a rough couple years. Uh, we also know it's during uh, Peter's um, junior year in high school. It was still in session because he's jumping out of the bus to help uh, uh, fight off Thanos' ship or, or um, uh, his, his, um, the children of Thanos' ship. Then we see all the blips. We get a flashback in Hawkeye to Yelena being blipped. Yikes. Uh, we get the flashback in Avengers Endgame to Hawkeye's family being blipped. We get uh, the Pym family being blipped at the end of uh, Ant-Man and the Wasp. And, of course, the, the ant playing solo drums. And, of course, we get in uh, Far From Home the, uh, the band being blipped. And, oh, I'm sorry, and, of course, we get Fury and Hill being blipped at the end of Infinity War. So, in addition to all the blipping in the actual Infinity War movie, we get all of these post credit scenes and other flashbacks, which is really cool. Then, of course, Captain Marvel arrives. The book says that's in spring of 2018. Uh, she goes then and rescues Stark, and they kill, slash behead, Thanos in uh, spring of 2018. Then they tell us the things that happened during the blip. And some of them are obvious. You know, one of them is the Stark family uh, grows because a little Morgan is born. And they don't to say when, but it's sometime between spring of 2018 and fall of 2023 that they just spend all this time together. Also, they don't give as much specifics on when Sharon became the power broker, although presumably it's soon after the blip. They just tell us that during this time frame, she operated as the power broker. Uh, now, the, it's interestingly, they do not have the um, references to Nakia leaving uh, after finding out she's pregnant. You know, uh, Ramonda says it's been six years since you left us, but they don't tell us when that is. Likewise, um, when she's talking to Okoye, uh, she says after Thanos' attack, when you left without saying a word, it hurt. Uh, and Nakia says, well, when he was taken away from me, referring, of course, to Chadwick Boseman's uh, Black Panther, R.I.P. Chadwick, uh, I just felt that I had to step away. So it seems that it's right after Thanos' attack, so therefore a fall of 2018. But I was really surprised, honestly, that these they didn't hammer this down because this was a big question a lot of us had. Uh, then we know that in late, it tells us in late 2019, that's when, after 18 months in Mexico, Smart Hulk arrives because he's able to uh, combine the two personalities. Uh, we know in 2020, that's when Maria Rambeau passes from cancer because they, they give us that date. And I will point out that in the Marvels, it's not a spoiler, but they show us this scene, which is really cool, where we find out that Carol actually did come back to visit her. Um, so yeah, she passed away in 2020. Once again, they give us a wide range when they tell us between spring of 2018 and fall of 2023, that's when Ronan had his rampage. Uh, and we do know that somewhere in there, they don't tell us exactly where, but a Ronan kills Maya's dad. Uh, we, get, we get a rough idea because when he's talking to Kazi, he says, look, you've been working under William Lopez as a lieutenant for what, four years? And now under Maya for a few more years. So that seems to place it near 
the end of the blip period, or maybe 2022 time frame or something. But anyway, they don't give us any more specifics, just that he's been Ronan this whole time. And of course, we learned this is the first time there's been a potential sighting of Ronan in years on the newscast. So my guess is he hasn't been in America for a while, and he was kind of undercover uh, as Ronan overseas killing people. Now, this was the biggest surprise. Mark Spector is saved by Khonshu and becomes Moon Knight in 2022. Did not see that coming, mainly because Layla in the uh, series says it's been 10 years since she's been to Egypt. And of course, she's in Egypt when uh, Mark becomes um, a Moon Knight. So I'm not sure what to make of this. That one really seemed out of left field to me, but that's what they've said. We'll see if they... They alter that, or maybe they just retcon this line a bit. So, they, now Miss Minutes does point out, uh, you know, hey there, darling, if you're still trying to find out who blipped or not, sometimes you can find clues in the most mundane details. And if you look closely, Mark Spector had a passport issued on December 14th of 2018. This points to his post military and questionable operations during the chaos of the blip. So, Miss Minutes is basically saying his passport is more important than Layla's line. Okay. I mean, I'm fine either way, and this makes him obviously not have been a Moon Knight for very long. So that's interesting, because the series, of course, happens in 2025, which we'll get to soon. All right, so then they also mention how from spring of 2018 to fall of 2023, Thor you know, gives up his leadership in New Asgard and becomes Bro Thor. <laughs> um, now, I just want to quickly mention the fallout from the snap. Uh, to show how bad it was during these five years. So this is the end of Infinity War when we're seeing a helicopter smash into the wall. So I think there was a ton of unintentional deaths because obviously if you were in that helicopter and weren't blipped, you're dead. Uh, there might have been people in airplanes where the pilot blipped or in cars where the driver blipped, getting surgery, uh, maybe in a, a train, uh, maybe on a bus. I, I just think there was a lot of unintentional deaths. And some people have said, well, Thanos would have made sure that didn't happen. But remember, he said he made it random. And if it's random, you may lose the pilot to an airplane. Uh, I also think the medical industry was really hurt. I think the scientific community was hurt, the energy industry, the food industry. So it was a really rough, rough five years. And we see that, right? This is in Endgame now. We've moved to 2023. And look at how bad that is. Look at all the, the, the boats docked in, in, around the Statue of Liberty and the cars left abandoned. And Oh, it's craziness. Uh, at this point, um, uh, Steve Rogers says, hey, you know, I saw a pod of whales and, she's, and uh, Black Widow says, in the Hudson? And he's like, well, there's fewer ships. So there were literally whales in the Hudson because there were so few ships. So yeah, it, it was bad. It was definitely bad during that period of time. Just something to keep in mind. Oh, and I love this. Torres says, uh, basically they, the Flag Smashers, think the world was better during the blip. Trust me, it wasn't. So yeah, I wish there were more stories during the blip period. Uh, I think it's a fascinating time, but you know, eh, I guess we won't get them at this point. All right, so then uh, we have uh, the rest of Endgame. So the Endgame started with you know uh, Thanos being killed and such in 2018, and then of course it jumps five years forward, and now we get the time heist and the final battle against Thanos, and of course uh, I am Iron Man as Tony Stark does the ultimate sacrifice. Uh, so during the craziness, uh, Loki escapes. So I'm putting fall of 2023, because even though it was in 2012 during the time heist, the time heist was happening in the fall of 2023, this timey-wimey stuff is really confusing. But anyway, Loki escapes during the time heist, of course. We know that Endgame is five years later because they tell us that. That's why it's in fall of 2023. Also, this interesting line from the Maw, he says that the nebula from 2023 is nine years in the future. So, you know, that was in 2014. So you had 2014 plus nine, you get 2023. So that really works well. Of course, Miss Marvel has that Easter egg we looked at earlier that literally says they returned in October of 2023, very specific. Um, and now we see everybody coming back in some of the flashbacks with Yelena from Hawkeye, with Monica in WandaVision, and with the band in Far From Home. So I think it's cool how they, they showed us some of these returns uh, through flashbacks in several different series. One thing I really feel like they should have told us is what exactly happened to Cap. Now, they tell us he went back to the 40s. Okay, that's helpful. And, of course, he eventually returns to fall of 2023. But notice all they say is rather than return to his own time, he rejoins Peggy Carter in the distant past. Okay, is it the distant past of a branch? <laughs> or is it the actual distant past? 
I guess we still don't know. And even the shield, I cannot figure out where he got the shield. I mean, there's ideas. We could all brainstorm ideas. But my point is I wanted them to tell us. And notice on the right, it just simply says, after Thanos is defeated by the Avengers, a now elderly Steve decides to pass his shield. Remember, his shield was destroyed in Endgame. So somehow he gets a different shield. Anyway, I would love for them to tell us uh, how it happened, but not today. Not today, clearly. All right, so then we go to the Loki series. So Loki season one, of course, had all the crazy variants, and then Loki and Sylvie approaching He Who Remains, who decides he's tired, and so Sylvie kills him. And it looks like everything goes crazy. Now, the timeline book specifically says this happens before WandaVision. I, I, I agree with anyone looking at this saying it's impossible for something outside of time to have a specific point when it impacts inside of time. I agree, but that's what the book says. <laughs> so I don't know what else to say. And also remember, Feige said that the events of Loki is what leads eventually to the events of No Way Home, Multiverse of Madness, etc. So we just have, it's science fiction, right? <laughs> so we just have to accept it. And of course, Loki season one and Loki season two happen back to back. I won't go into any details, I guess, in case someone hasn't seen it. I have lots of videos on Loki season two, obviously, but it's in green because I did not expect the book would have mentioned this. It's in phase five. So then we move into uh, uh, phase four. So uh, WandaVision uh, have, has its flashbacks happen, which is Wanda going to see Vision's body and then Wanda in distress going to visit Westview and creating the Hex all in fall of 2023. Monica uh, coming back from her blip and then returning to S.W.O.R.D. Uh, and they mentioned it's been three weeks since the blip and you're the first to report. And then finally, Monica heads to Westview. So these were all those flashbacks that they caught us up on uh, as the series went along. Loved WandaVision, such a great series. And then of course you have the main series itself with Wanda fighting uh, Agatha Harkness in fall of 2023. And then uh, if you needed any more evidence, this calendar that shows up in the series uh, perfectly matches uh, November of 2023. So love it, very nice detail. Then we have another little Miss Minutes appearance because Jimmy Woo says that Wanda was born in Sokovia in 1989. Okay, great. But then they bring up a computer display, which it's very blurry, but if you look in the upper right-hand corner, that is 1988. So Miss Minutes says, howdy. In a briefing to the security team, FBI agent Jimmy Woo says Wanda and her brother Pietro were born in Sokovia in 1989, but the classified sword file he shows them cites her birth as 1988. Heavens to Betsy, which is right. It's hard to know for sure because so many records were destroyed during Sokovia's conflicts, but that's just me speculating. We'll dive a little deeper to see what we can find. No, you're not going to dive a little deeper. You never answer it. Darn you, Miss Minutes. Stop teasing us. Give us answers. <laughs> anyway, uh, then they tell us the post credit scenes happen uh, right after that. In fall of 2023, Monica gets a message from an old friend, and they do uh, canonize that Wanda immediately begins studying the Darkhold. So that means she literally was looking at this copy of the Darkhold for a full year. So if there's any doubt that you know, that would have taken over her and made her a total mess in, in Multiverse of Madness. Uh, this, this really codifies it here. Then we move to Shang-Chi in the spring of 2024 uh, when he battles his father, Wen Wu. Uh, and you can see there, uh, uh, Trevor, of course, appears, and Wong. Great movie, awesome phase four movie. Uh, now it's in spring because the passage to Tao Lo opens during Qing Ming. Notice they say that it only opens once a year on Qing Ming. Now, Qing Ming, in particular, always happens on April 4th and 5th. It's not based on a lunar calendar, um, but instead it happens on the same day every year. So they, they were smart to place it in spring of 2024. If you remember the Disney Plus timeline, this was the only thing they got wrong, but then they fixed it. So that's great. Uh, there's some other hints in the movie. The calendar has a four uh, and spring flowers to make it look like spring of 2024. Uh, you have spring's top talent as a magazine article. Uh, there's, a, there's a piece of mail that's a few months old and it's post dated 12 4, so that would fit in spring. Um, and then this is interesting. So, would international travel be easy in spring? Well, we learn in Falcon and the Winter Soldier, which I haven't got to yet, but I'm mentioning this now because it's important, that the GRC formally began drafting legislation known as the Patch Act which would seek to restore traditional border regulations. So that means, since that hasn't happened yet, there are no border regulations. So international travel would be very easy. Imagine if you could just get in a plane and fly anywhere in the world because there are no borders. Craziness. 
and keep this in mind because this is actually going to impact far from home as well. So hold this thought. But yeah, that's why Shang-Chi could travel around with ease. And then it is worth mentioning uh, this bus advertisement just clearly went up in advance, right? It, it, July, it's advertising something in July and we're only in spring. That happens all the time. So no problem there. All right, they then tell us that the two post credit scenes immediately happen at this point. Zhai Ling taking over the Ten Rings and uh, the, uh, Shang-Chi and Katie working with uh, Captain Marvel, Wong, and Bruce to explore the origin of the Ten Rings. So now finally we move to Falcon and the Winter Soldier and their adventures together, which are in spring of 2024, or I should say most of the episodes. Episodes one through five are in spring of 2024. So uh, we, we learned that Sam has been with the Air Force for six months, so that nicely places it in April. I've been working for the Air Force for six months now, he says. Uh, also, all the way up to episode four, they're still talking about something happening six months ago. Uh, the, Globo, the Global Repatriation Council promised us to send more teachers and supplies, and that was six months ago. So episodes one through five, again, all happen in the spring which means the Dora Milaje appearance where they try to take Zemo and then ultimately uh, in episode five when they capture Zemo, as well as um, Sam and his training all still happen in spring. So I really liked this. We're now gonna see there is a big gap before we get to episode six. So that means Sam has actually been training for several months. If you watch the episode, it feels like he trained for like an afternoon, <laughs> which I love Sam, but Ain't no way he figures out that shield like in a day or two. So yeah, it literally is several months because after episode five, we jump, by the way, the end of episode five does jump into episode six. So technically, let's just say the majority of episode five happens, but not the tail end. That's going to be down the road because now instead we jump to T'Challa passing away, which was the flashback we saw in Wakanda Forever. So in spring of 2024, that's when T'Challa, uh, R.I.P. Chadwick, uh, passes away. And there we see his coffin, and then the movie jumps one year later. So we'll get to that when we get to spring of 2025. So now let's take a brief moment to look at the state of the world six months after the blip, because I do think this is interesting. So we learned that a few months ago, billions of people reappeared after five years away, sending the world into turmoil. Uh, the criminals, I'm assuming, are trying to take advantage of all the chaos and make some money. Uh, Rhodes says the world's a crazy place right now. Allies are enemies. Alliances are torn apart. The world is broken. Uh, on TV, unrest in the wake of recent events has left us vulnerable. The world is upside down. The GRC are trying the best they can to get things up and running post blip, reactivating citizenship, social security, health care. Yikes. People don't even have social security or health care? My word. Uh, then they're looking to move upwards of 20 million refugees back to their countries of origin. And those settlements that they're talking about have happened have, and been that way for five years. For five years, people have been in settlement camps waiting to go home. Yikes. And then finally, the GRC formally began drafting legislation known as the Patch Act, which would seek to restore traditional border regulations, which we discussed before. But keep in mind, there still are no borders. So yeah, the world is definitely a mess. I appreciate Falcon and the Winter Soldier for going into detail on that to let us know, you know how bad things were. And so now we move to the summer of 2024 with Spider-Man fighting Mysterio in Far From Home. And notice, we still have not had Falcon and the Winter Soldier episode six happen yet. That means the borders are still not in place. So the international travel that we see in this movie, well, it would make sense, right? They're able to fly anywhere. Uh, so the movie uh, sets the stage by telling us that it's at the end of the school year. It's the last day of school. Um, they mention also the snap was over five years ago. Over five years ago, half of all life on the universe vanished. Uh, and then they mention the snap was during semester two. Even though we had blipped away halfway through the school year, uh, and had already taken midterms, and then they had to redo everything. And they said that everyone returned eight months ago. So I will give Far From Home a lot of credit. It very firmly places itself uh, in the timeline. It's in summer of 2024. And they also mentioned there's still people displaced uh, from their homes, which makes sense after all that stuff we saw in Falcon and the Winter Soldier. So not everyone is doing terribly, but a lot of people are. Uh, you know, Thank you for coming out to support those who have been displaced by the blip. Uh, it's worth noting that the Festival of Lights featured in Far From Home is actually in November, uh, not in summertime, but they didn't care. <laughs> they admitted that they got it wrong, so that's fine. Uh, then this is interesting. Uh, Miss Minutes jumps in to say, hey, y'all, 
how did conman Quentin Beck know this dimension is called Earth-616 when the existence of the multiverse hasn't been proven? Good question, y'all. Maybe Beck picked up Selvig's theories from over a decade ago, but now I'm the one getting ahead of things. Isn't that funny? So Miss Minutes is taking the fact that, that Beck called this uh, Earth Dimension 616 and saying maybe he looked at Selvig 616. <laughs> I love it. They're trying to tie it all together. Trying to tie it all together. All right, so then at the end of Far From Home, of course, Spider-Man's identity is revealed. And uh, there is a, the, the new Asgard political turmoil Easter egg. So we know at this point in time that there's turmoil in new Asgard. I made this one red because they didn't specifically mention this uh, in the timeline book, but this is when it happens in, in, the, in the course of the movies. Uh, I wish they would have mentioned Talos reaching out to Fury. They did not actually mention this post credit scene, which that surprised me a little bit, but we know that happened right after Far From Home. Then finally... <laughs> Finally, in the summer of 2024, the Flag Smasher battle in New York. So yeah, it's only at this point that they then um, pass the Patch Act and restore the borders. But also, it is interesting to note, I've always wondered why didn't Spider-Man come and help uh, Sam and uh, U.S. agent, etc. in the battle? Well, now we know. His identity had just been outed, and he was pretty much staying out of the public eye, probably hiding in his apartment, if I remember right. So yeah, it totally makes sense how they align these things together that this final battle in New York happened after uh, Peter's identity had been revealed. And then we do get all of the wrap-up in Falcon and the Winter Soldier, in particular, uh, Sharon Carter, uh, the power broker, uh, having that post in that post credit scene. But so they're saying all that happens in summer of 2024. Uh, and then we jump to uh, a little further into No Way Home, not long after his identity is revealed, now uh, Matt Murdock, a really good lawyer, comes in and helps him. I love him catching the brick. That was epic. And then now in the fall of 2024, Peter returns to high school. So again, we're in No Way Home, the beginning of No Way Home. Then we jump to episode one of She-Hulk, which is essentially a flashback during the majority of it. That's in fall of 2024. And of course, that's when she becomes Hulk and learns about spandex. <laughs> and it's kind of cool because this fits because in one of the uh, bars that she goes to, uh, notice it says uh, so-and-so, Greer was here, but 10-4, so October 4th. So yeah, it's probably happening in Octo early October, i.e. fall of 2024, so that works. Uh, then we get one of the strangest placements, I know, but fall of 2024, Icarus meets with Ajax. Now this is a flashback seven days or six days before the movie itself, so six days ago, and Ajax learns the emergence is going to be in seven days. Um, and of course, we get the infamous quote, five years ago, Thanos erased half the population of the universe, delayed the emergence, but the people of this planet brought everyone back with a snap of a finger. So obviously that probably should have been six years ago, but as I said in my other video on this particular placement, you know, she's an eternal, what's five versus six years to her? <laughs> Regardless, I would, I would have loved Miss Minutes to say something about this, but she doesn't, darn it. Ah, that would have been nice. Anyway, so then we get, after that flashback to their meeting, uh, Ajax and Icarus, we then finally get to the movie itself uh, and the battles with the Deviants and, of course, Erisham showing up. Cold weather works really well for this being in the fall, uh, you know, late uh, mid to late October, maybe early November. Notice the pumpkin there on, uh, down in the lower left. Uh, there is a GRC Easter egg, so they are still welcoming people back. But I think more than welcoming them back, like, they just arrived. This is more just saying, hey, we know you're back. We'd like to help you. So, I mean, it works in 2024. I will admit that that particular Easter egg works a little better in fall of 2023, but we'll let it go. Anyway, uh, so the GRC is still in force, and we will see, even in Moon Knight coming up in a few months, the GRC is still continuing to advertise. So it all works. All right, Sprite refers to uh, Rogers, Steve Rogers, as Captain Rogers instead of Captain America, and my guess is because we have a new Captain America now you know, Sam Wilson. So that makes sense. Uh, and then I'm not going to go through this. You can watch my video on uh, the effect of the blip, but you can look at these numbers. And I just think one of the reasons they put Eternals in 2024 is when everybody came back, there were so many deaths that happened during the blip. And as a result of the initial blip that it took until 2024 for the population to get back up to a point where Tiamat could emerge. I think we actually came out of the blip with less people 
is the is the point. So you can look that over and see if you agree with it. But I just think that's why um, Marvel ultimately thought Eternals is better in 2024. So who knows? Uh, then we do get a confirmation uh, in the book that both of the post credit scenes, the one with uh, the Ebony Blade and the one with Star Fox, happen in a fall of 2024. Then we move back to No Way Home again. Isn't it wild? We're just jumping back and forth between things everywhere. So now the main body of No Way Home happens where he fights the different villains. Notice in the upper left, the Halloween decorations coming down. So that, again, places this in uh, early November. Uh, then I'm kind of bummed that he didn't mention the post credit scenes. I mean, they're all goofy. But yeah, Venom and Vulture getting bounced back and forth. You know, Venom coming from the Venom universe over to our universe and then getting sent back to Venom universe. And my most hated post credit scene on the planet, but Vulture being taken to the Morbius universe. Ugh. I'm hoping that across the Spider-Verse that, that when they fixed all the villains that went to the wrong places, I hope he got fixed too. Anyway, I would have loved for the timeline book to mention these. It does not. Bummer. Um, then we move to fall of 2024 for the Doctor Strange uh, 2 Multiverse of Madness movie. Picks up basically right after that main part of uh, No Way Home ends. And of course, he fights Wanda and all kinds of other craziness. His watch, actually, which is still working, it may be cracked, but it's actually still working, uh, shows a November month. So that works perfectly. Um, and then they do mention that the post credit scene with the freaky deaky eye is in fall of 2024. So that is basically right after the movie ends. So I can't wait for them to pick up on this. I know they're going to do another Doctor Strange movie. Um, but yeah, is it going to pick up right after this point, or is he gone for a couple of years? I don't know. But anyway, the post credit scene is right after the movie. They don't tell us when Pizza Papa stops hitting himself. I want to know, darn it. So I'm guessing it's right around this time. Uh, the movie implies that. And then we go back to No Way Home again. So No Way Home was split up all over the place as Peter swings over Rockefeller Center. And then we jump to Hawkeye. Of course, Hawkeye comes to visit New York, sees the musical. Then we finally get the post credit scene from A Black Widow where Yelena is recruited. And then she shows up in Hawkeye. And then we get the big finale uh, as well as some other great scenes. And so, yeah, it's just a fun, just a fun uh, series. I'm looking forward to watching it again this Christmas. Uh, and then we know it is 2024 because the holiday party is listed uh, on, on her wall, on Kate's wall, as being December 24th of 2024. So that's cool. And she won a fencing tournament in 2024. So very nice. All right. So they don't actually tell us specifically when this happens, although we can derive it pretty easily. But I do believe it's in 2025, early 2025, when Mark avoids his mother's shiva when she dies. And then he goes, you know, he, he loses it and Stephen takes over because Mark says, ah, this is it, mom's death and Shiva two months ago. So this is just a few months before the series itself, probably in February of 2025. Also, Layla says, I've been texting and calling you for months. So this flashback fits here, but you know, again, wasn't in the timeline book specifically. Uh, then, so we've got that happening. Then we go to She-Hulk. Remember She-Hulk? We forgot about that, right? So we, we had episode one, most of it, uh, which was a flashback. Now, the rest of episode one, where Titania smashes through the wall, as well as episode two, where she gets her new job, and episode three, where uh, Wong comes in and helps with uh, Blonsky's defense, that all happens in spring of 2025. So now we've had She-Hulk episodes one, two, and three have all occurred. Um, and then it's also in episode three that they have the reference to the statue of a man sticking out of the ocean, which, love it or hate it, it does help that Eternals is in October 2024 because, you know, maybe it makes sense then that by spring of 2025, people start talking about it. It works. It all works. Um, and then it's just worth mentioning really quickly, summarizing, because I know this has come up many times, it's confusing, this whole situation with Blonsky, the video, Hulk, etc. So Hulk got his injury you know, of his arm in fall of 2023. We see the cage fight in spring of 2024. He's still using the inhibitor at the end of the Shang-Chi movie in spring of 2024. We now know, thanks to the book, that his accident and then She-Hulk becoming She-Hulk, uh, Jen becoming She-Hulk, is in fall of 2024. And then now here we all in, are in spring of 2025. That's when the video is released. And you know, my theory all along has been that it was an illegal fight club. The dude took a legal video, kept it on his phone, and then finally a year later, when Blonsky was in the news, he's like, oh, I can sell this to the press. Rock on. Um, we do get Wong showing up, making the reference to the No Way Home spell. It is weird when he says, I know what you're thinking, and I'm not erasing anyone's memories, since he didn't do the memory spell. 
I still think, though, he's talking about it, and he's just taking ownership. In the greater sense, he's saying, I'm, as in, you know, since he's Sorcerer Supreme, all of us are responsible. Uh, then he says, not again. Uh, yeah, it's very messy, believe me. Uh, then it's kind of funny because we see his the, the phone that says that he went from librarian to Sorcerer Supreme, and that's kind of cool because if you look at his outfit, outfit chronology, it really fits. You know, as, at, the way the timeline book has put things together with Doctor Strange, then Infinity War, then Shang-Chi, No Way Home, and then notice, then finally in Multiverse of Madness, he switches because he's become Sorcerer Supreme, and then his appearance in She-Hulk. And I have to say, upper left-hand corner, Doctor Strange, he looks like he's Ned's dad. Ned from uh, the Spider-Man movies, right? And remember, Ned uses the sling ring. Maybe, maybe Wong <laughs> is Ned's long-lost dad. Who knows? Anyway, uh, so then we move to spring of 2025 with Moon Knight when he bar- battles Haro. Um, and the reason this is placed in spring of 2025 is because uh, is evidenced because he goes in to complain about the exhibit. Says, hey, you've got seven gods here and there's nine in the Ennead. Well, if he complains about that, he would do it when the exhibit starts. And notice it starts in April 22nd. So spring of 2025 works perfect. Um, So yeah, that that kind of places it. And then remember I mentioned GRC still advertising. So granted the Eternals Easter egg was a little weird, but nonetheless, here they are uh, a year and a half later, uh, still uh, advertising for the GRC. Uh, and then also we see a lot of spring flowers and blooms, so that works perfectly with the spring placement. And then they do canonize that the post credit scene happens right afterwards, so there's no delay, and it's in spring of 2025 that Jake certainly seems to kill Haro. Uh, then from Love and Thunder, we get a flashback to Jane uh, taking her final blood test, notice dated uh, April 30th, and then it, ultimately she heads to New Asgard. So that takes place in the timeline right now, which also means... From this point forward, she is the Mighty Thor. That's going to be important for a She-Hulk reference coming up. So yeah, she is Mighty Thor after she takes this blood test and heads to New Asgard. Then we jump to Wakanda Forever, where uh, uh, and, uh, Wakanda uh, and uh, many more uh, all battle no more. Uh, Ironheart also helps with the battle. That's in spring of 2025. Um, and then you know we get appearances from Ross and Val, uh, Riri Williams, etc., um, and there is a deleted scene that basically has an early May date. Uh, you notice that date down there, uh, which helps place, again, this in May. And, of course, the movie kicks off uh, one year after the death of T'Challa, which was in spring of 2024. Uh, then the post credit scene is shown to be happening basically right after the movie ends, which isn't surprising. Uh, but member Shuri meets Toussaint, uh, and uh, Nakia says, we agreed it was better for him to grow up here away from the pressure of the throne. So that fits in perfectly. Um, uh, But he didn't want us to go to the funeral. So they stayed here. Also in Wakanda Forever, we got the Easter egg about Scott Lang's book tour. So we know he's doing his book tour in spring of 2025. Uh, And we also get the Easter egg about New Asgard. We've gotten several uh, so far about New Asgard. So they were were in political turmoil earlier. Now they're signing a uh, trade pact with uh, Ritson. So we know Ritson's also president at this point, and that's, again, in spring of 2025. All right, now we move to episode four of She-Hulk. And this is the one where they fight Donnie Blaze and Wong helps, which is awesome. And this is in spring of 2025. And they don't mention it, and I'm only mad because I love this post credit scene. One of my favorite of all time, which is Wong hanging out with Madison. Uh, but obviously it happens at the same time as the episode itself. Uh, and this is kind of cool. This really works well. So it's in spring, right? Well, this dude's saying my movie just premiered at Sundance, which is in late January. So that's perfect that this uh, would be in spring. Also in this episode, she's planning for her summer uh, interviews uh, and summer associate, uh, associate outings. So yeah, this is perfect in spring. It's after January and it's before summer. So love it. That's episode four. Then we jump to finally the rest of She-Hulk, episodes five through nine. So, and that's in summer of 2025. So she battles Titania over the trademarks. Never a good time for a wedding, right? She ends up having to go to the wedding. It's a spur of the moment wedding, by the way, obviously. She visits Blonsky's retreat um, and, and, you know, has a relaxing time there. Her blood is stolen. This is important because I always wondered when she rewrote some of the plot, how much she rewrote. She did, they did, she did not rewrite this. So either she didn't, she probably didn't know what happened, to be honest, which is pretty wild. But anyway, so they do steal her blood because I think that is going to come into play in Captain America 4. So that's very helpful to know. 
Uh, then she meets up with Daredevil, and, and then now we're all the way to episode eight. Now, the end of episode eight is when she goes to that awards banquet and goes nuts when they reveal uh, all the sensitive information about her. And then we move to episode nine, of course, with the Hulk King and all that craziness. This is so funny. So I'm just going to post some pictures from the book here. Notice, she scribbles out the story that she erased. So now we know specifically the portions of her story she erased. And notice it says, Intelligentsia humiliate Jen Walters when she's accepting an award at the Los Angeles Legal Gala. So I'm not going to read it all, but I wanted to say that's the point where she starts erasing. Everywhere from there forward. And then this is funny. She does an arrow pointing down to go, this is my story. And notice it's handwritten by her. Even the the description of the picture, Jennifer Walter seizes control of her own narrative. That is awesome. So very helpful to know. Basically, the end of episode eight, the tail end of it, and everything in episode nine up to when she goes to see Kevin, that's what she nuked and, and made go away. Uh, so then it's also worth noting uh, the uh, Rogers, the musical, how it shows up all over the place in Hawkeye, in Multiverse of Madness, No Way Home, and then finally in the lower right in She-Hulk. I love that. Uh, we also know that, that the finale, uh, episode eight and episode nine, are happening in the summer of 2025 because we get this date of 816. So that helps place it uh, mid August timeframe. That's cool. And I alluded to this earlier, but because uh, Jane Foster is indeed in um, New Asgard now and probably is getting some fame and recognition. That allows you know goofballs like this dude to call her Lady Thor in uh, in his derogatory fashion. But the reference makes sense, so that's really cool. All right, they don't actually mention um, when the the post credit scene happens with Blonsky, but it is worth noting. I really like it being in 2025. In fact, summer of 2025 because that gives time for poor. Uh, Comertage to have been um, fixed up a bit because it got de- decimated by Wanda. So anyway, I, I, I suspect this that this happened soon after the end of episode uh, nine, but they don't tell us, so I'm just going with summer for now. Uh, then we move to fall of 2025, which is Miss Marvel uh, battling, of course, the clandestines. Uh, worst villains ever, but I love the series, love Miss Marvel. Um, and then also, this is now the point when Kamala's bangle takes her back to 1947. So again, she was summoned backwards, as we saw earlier, into time. I thought that was really cool. And also, I had forgotten about this, but her bangle opens the rift in space. Again, I don't want to give any spoilers away for Miss Marvel or for the Marvels if you haven't seen it yet, but let's just say that it makes all the more sense now that um, the bangles can open up rifts between dimensions. I'll just leave it at that. But yeah, this scene. Ponder this scene if you've seen the Marvels. And if you haven't seen the Marvels, remember this scene because those bangles are fascinating. It allowed Kamala to go back in time and allowed Kamala to open a rift in space between another dimension, the Noor dimension. Fascinating. All right. Uh, then it's it, this is a reference to the fact that Miss um, Marvel happens after She-Hulk because notice in damage control on their wall, if you look real close, you can see some of the villains, uh, Titania and Mr. Immortus um, or Mr. Immortal. Uh, so that's kind of cool. All right, then um, also uh, it's worth noting that uh, Miss Marvel talks about Scott Lang's podcast going on. So he's been doing his book tour, uh, which we know now uh, was at least in May, if not more. And he's also doing his podcast. Very famous at this point. And we know that Scott and Hope went on a vacation together around this time frame. So that's cool. We know it's in 2025 because this is one of the few times, in fact, maybe the only time that I can remember them giving us a specific date of you know 2025 in anything. Uh, or 2024, for that matter. But notice the street vendor's uh, sanitation grade is 2025. And again, second time, we get um, her uh, driver's ed registration ending in 2025. So I'm not sure how they got away with it in Miss Marvel, but nowhere else do they seem allowed to actually give us a year uh, in in the shows. And then it is worth noting, of course, that uh, um, the Eid celebration, and this is the second Eid in, in, in the show, but the Eid celebration should have been in June uh, 6 to 7, uh, but it wasn't. It was in fall because it was the beginning of Kamala's school year. So uh, the only thing I can guess is they just, just wanted to include an Eid because it's culturally significant, and I did learn a lot about it. I'm glad they included it, but they didn't really care that it wasn't really happening normally in fall. Maybe the blip changed it, right? There's all kinds of reasons, and you could watch my video on Miss Marvel because I talk more about it there. All right, I thought this was interesting. Date unverified. Gore takes his vow. I personally like it being much earlier because I like to think that maybe Gore had something to do with some of the gods um, 
missing in, in uh, Moon Knight uh, when the Ennead met. Remember, they didn't all show up. Maybe he had something to do with Bast um, being busy and not helping Shuri. Who knows? Maybe, maybe not. But anyway, this is where they put it in the book. But then they also said, date unverified. Very interesting. All right. But the rest of Thor, Love, and Thunder, they say, happens in fall of 2025. I know that a lot of people don't like the idea of Thor being with the Guardians for two solid years. My guess, and the book does not go into this, but my guess is he isn't with them for two solid years. They're getting together off and on, on a mission-by-mission basis. But nonetheless, they appear in the movie. Obviously, Jane gets cancer. Uh, Gore starts butchering. Valkyrie has some awesome scenes. And, of course, Gore there before um, eternity at the end. So that means in fall of 2025, that's when Jane met up with um, a Thor for the first time in years. Uh, that led to the eight years, seven months, and six days, which takes us back to the March date of the breakup, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, Jane also then gives us the six months ago is when she came to New Asgard, and that's why uh, she came in April. That works perfect. Uh, when she had that diagnosis and the blood test, remember, with the 430. Uh, then Love and Thunder jump into action. That happens at this point. And they also canonize when both of the post credit scenes happen. I think it's really clear that the Jane Foster one needs to happen right away because she died and would go to Valhalla. It was a little unclear when the Hercules one, you know, maybe they would have pushed it further down the timeline. Nope, they're saying it happened, uh, you know, fall of 2025. So, okay, great. Um, I do think this placement works. On the left, if you look at New Asgard, that's during Endgame. It looks really bad. On the right is how it looks now. I mean, tourism has really picked up, but it probably took a while. So that's good. A couple years for it to pick up. That's all good. Thor had time to get his god bod back. That works. Uh, Darcy, her appearance in WandaVision was, you know, a whole, what, two years ago. So there's a lot of space there for her to then show up and be with Jane during her cancer. Uh, we know that Jane's been Mighty Thor for several months, almost six months. I like that. And then, of course, you got good old Groot and his growth patterns. There's no figuring this guy out. I just kind of compiled it all there if you want to check it out. But yeah, there, he, he's a living tree. There's no explaining it. And, and by the way, lower right-hand corner, that's the post credit to Guardians of Volume 3, and who knows when that thing's happening. So anyway, love Groot, but no figuring out his growth patterns. Then in fall of 2025, that's when Jack and Ted fight the Hunters in the Werewolf by Night uh, Halloween special. And I, it's interesting, in the book, they use the color photo. Isn't that wild? So I, I'm not sure what that means. Maybe they're canonizing that it's actually in color. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it, it was just an interesting choice. Uh, and then I love this. Good old Miss Minutes making things confusing. She says, these events seem to occur in 2025, but magical influences can make stuff like this hard to pin down. Okay, what are you telling us, Miss Minutes? You're messing with us now. You're messing with us. <laughs> so I'm assuming it's fall of 2025, but she kind of opens the door that it could be any time. Uh, we do know it's after Avengers uh, team up in 2012 because they make a reference to them in, in the um, show, in the special presentation. They also mention that Ulysses' bloodstone was slain on the last full moon of the year at the end of the bloodshed. So therefore, my assumption is it's the last full moon of 2024, and then it says the next full moon's in five days. So if um, that full moon was on November 5th, it lands perfectly on October 31st. Gotta love it, right? Gotta love it. Also, uh, Jack wears Dia de la Mortos face paintings, which is perfect for an October uh, Halloween time frame. All right, then they canonize that um, the Guardians holiday special is indeed in December of 2025. And that's really important because that means anything in the Disney Plus timeline after the Guardians holiday special is in 2026. So uh, Peter Quill, of course, gets himself a Kevin Bacon-sized uh, gift, um, and then the post credit scene is Groot failing as a Christmas tree. So that is the end of the timeline book. I'm going to go ahead and quickly spin through 2026, because I do think it's helpful to put all of this together. But of course, everything from here on is not um, timeline canon. It's just based off Disney Plus and other facts that you can find in the episodes. So I do believe that Quantumania is in July of 2026 when they fight Kang. Um, and of course, the post credit scene, I'm assuming, is around this same time frame of July of 2026. Why do I say July? Because we see uh, this July 24th date uh, when he's doing his book reading. I do not think this is still the book tour because uh, that would be way too long to still be doing it. This is just a casual event at a library, so that's cool. Uh, also, the, the ending scene where they come back from the quantum realm seems to be a few weeks later, maybe, because he, notice he's healing up. Uh, he's still got his scars, but he's healing up somewhat. 
Uh, Cassie's birthday, I don't know, I'm not even going to get into it. It's so crazy. I'm just summarizing the fact that they say she's six in the first Ant-Man, right? A guy dressed like a bee tried to kill me when I was six. In Ant-Man 2, Ant-Man and the Wasp, Scott places her age at 10. Hey, you try to entertain a 10-year-old. But then we know that in the movie, she's 18 because she's held in a county jail and you have to be an adult to be in a county jail. So it had to have hit her birthday, which we learned in the first Ant-Man movie is in July. So, in fact, there she is in a detention cell with other adults. So she has to be 18. And then, yeah, it's just crazy because uh, to try to fit all this in, I mean, they're, they're retconning that she wasn't 10. In fact, she was really nine in Ant-Man and the Wasp. You know, that's fine. Uh, and then I'm guessing her birthday hadn't happened yet, which is why she was still six in the first Ant-Man movie. But all of that, I believe, this retconning was to make her 18 in 2026. So, okay, whatever. Uh, I also think it was Peyton Reed making a mistake. But nonetheless, it's canon now. Um, then I think August of 2026 is when the Guardians fight the High Evolutionary. Um, this one's really hard to place. I mean, we know it's after the holiday special, and we know that he still has not met up with Gamora because they say, yeah, he's been pretty mopey ever since Gamora died. She's not dead. She just doesn't remember anything from the last few years. So obviously they haven't reunited with Gamora yet. Um, James Gunn does tweet and say that while he doesn't think the Guardians were with Thor for two years, he really hates that, but he does say there's probably a couple years between Endgame and Volume 3, so that works. Um, but the thing that I think places it the most is when they're reading this newspaper at the end, notice it says Kevin Bacon shares all about his alien abduction, and that's referring to the holiday special, so we know it's after the holiday special, and which that's obvious, but nonetheless, they make it clear. But also in this newspaper, there's this uh, article about bad weather won't keep public at bay, festival to continue. So we're talking St. Charles and a festival. Well, there happens to be a huge festival, 350,000 people attend it, uh, that is every August. Okay, it's called the Festival of the Little Hills. We'll go with August then. I mean, I, we don't have anything else to really go off of other than we know it's after July and this fits in August. Uh, then we get to Secret Invasion, oh my. So, uh, of course, Nick Fury fights Gravik. Um, well, or maybe Gaia does, as the case may be. We know it's 30 years after Captain Marvel, which was in 1995, so November 2026 would work for that. And we'll get to why it's November in a second, because he says, you know, it's down below, it started 30 years ago when the Scrolls found Earth, and Carol Danvers and Nick Fury promised to find them a new planet. So it's 30 years after Captain Marvel. We know Fury's been off-world for a few years, because that's what Talos says. You know, it's heavy down here, man. I got to go up to my space station. He's making fun of Fury, saying, you've been gone up there for years. So he has not returned to Earth after he left for the space station. And then here's the real important thing. Notice that the, the, the first episode occurs on Unity Day. And Unity Day in Russia is on November 4th. So that places it firmly in November of 2026. So, okay, great. And then you've got President Ritson's speech regarding aliens, where he says, I'm going to sign a bill that designates all off-world-born species as enemy combatants, and we will kill every last one of you. Yikes. So that's one of the big reasons I think this does fit in 2026, because if it was November 2025, it would only be one month before, well, this, right? In December of 2025, with Drax and Mantis walking around town, having a blast, people taking pictures, and sure, they might have thought these were people in costume, but still, Ritson said basically, you can shoot on sight anyone that looks like an alien. I would not want to be standing next to someone even in a costume. Plus, they go bar hopping, so it seems hard to imagine that people might still think they're in costume. And the police showed a lot of restraint here, you know, because they probably would, would be fine shooting them on sight because they're dressed like aliens or they are. But instead, they said, I don't know what's going on here, but you need to back up or I'll shoot. So, yeah, it just seems like Secret Invasion has to be November 2026. Then, of course, we get this quote uh, where uh, Fury is talking about how the, uh, the Kree said they're open to peace talks with the Scrolls, which, of course, that uh, segues nicely into the Marvels. Now, this is the section where I'm going to talk very briefly about the Marvels. If you haven't seen it yet and you want to skip past it to the next chapter, that's fine. I, I totally understand. But so uh, for those still watching, uh, the Marvels, of course, they battled Darben, um, and they're all three are awesome uh, in this movie. Uh, now, it, it codifies when the post credit scene in the Miss Marvel's show happens. Basically, it happens seemingly a year, uh, no, yeah, a year and a half later, almost a year and a half later. Crazy. Uh, so she's basically in her senior year now instead of her junior year. Uh, but 
And sure enough, here's the Kree Scroll peace talks uh, that were mentioned in uh, Secret Invasion. And we get an appearance by Valkyrie, who takes them back, I'm presuming, to New Asgard, which is really funny, since, of course, New Asgard is also aliens. So I'm wondering if she, like, despite Ritson, brought the, brought the scrolls back uh, to New Asgard, where they have safe haven. That's funny, if so. Very Valkyrie thing to do. <laughs> um, and then we see that the bangles cause an incursion, or start to cause an incursion. Technically, it's not a real incursion until the two worlds collide, but... Um, it certainly opens a rift between universes, and that's totally consistent with them opening the rift with the Nor dimension, which we saw in the Miss Marvel show, Wild. Uh, then at the end, Kamala forms a team, and of course, one of those members is going to be Kate Bishop, and they mention Cassie Lang, so that's very cool. We finally see Kate again after two years in the MCU. Uh, and then Monica, on the other hand, wakes up on the other side of that rift, and so we get our big crossover with a binary uh, who looks like her mom, but she's a variant, obviously. Uh, and then we get Beast as well. So very, very cool. Um, and then the only issue is that says Kamala is 16, but there's no way she could be 16 because she was also 16 in the Miss Marvel show. So they have to figure out what they're going to do with that. Maybe this is, she wrote 16 on here and just hasn't updated it. Certainly possible. So we need Miss Minutes to come in and tell us what happened. All right, then, uh, while that was phase five that isn't in the book, what if is in the book, but it's interesting. They stick it at the very back. So rather than it being somewhere chronologically in the timeline, it's almost like an appendix. And then I'm not expecting you to be able to read this. I'm just really showing you that they have this diagram showing the branch points where each of the new universes was created. So the year in which they were created. So that's pretty cool. But yeah, they're basically saying, hey, it's part of the multiverse. And it's really the only multi major multiversal thing that they cover in here uh, besides like No Way Home and, and um, uh, Multiverse of Madness, obviously. And then finally, yeah, we have to rip on Miss Minutes a little bit because, hey, she was ripping on everybody else. So even she makes mistakes. The book does have a few typos. If we start in the upper left, in the uh, Multiverse of Bandits entry, notice they refer to Wanda's kids as Bobby and Billy. Oops. And then as we rotate around, we've got uh, some Endgame references in 2024. That's not true. And as we continue around, uh, Wanda is listed as Natasha Romanoff. No. <laughs> and then finally, uh, there we have a Falcon and the Winter Soldier, which is listed as happening in 2025, when obviously it's in 2024. So these were all just typos. But I had to put him in because Miss Minutes was ripping on everybody else. I see you in the center there, Miss Minutes. Yeah, you caused the red line alert this time. Sorry. And then I will mention there is a spreadsheet sitting out on my Google Drive, and that has basically everything that we discussed here in this video, uh, and you can sort it by both release order or by timeline order, so you can choose how you want to see it, and so in this case, it's by release order, and one of the cool things if you do it by release order is, notice it makes a section, for example, for Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, that brings all of the flashbacks, the movie, and the post-credit all together. So you can see, you know, all the different times when it occurs. So that's kind of cool. And then, of course, timeline order would be the order to watch it if you want to try to do it in timeline order. Also, you can do filters, and you can filter out, you know, to just see uh, the flashbacks, for example. So if you just choose flashbacks, now see, only those show up. So you only get 129 rows. So feel free to play around with that. You can download it, edit it away. Uh, it's yours to have fun with. Don't forget, we do have the November contest. All you have to do to enter is be a subscriber and leave a comment, and you might win one of these books or steel books. And also, we do have the membership option if you're interested in supporting the channel in that way. Plus, don't forget, we do have Discord. I will leave a pinned comment so you can join our Discord server if you're interested. Here we are talking about timelines, very appropriate for the timeline book. Also, if you don't mind, like this video, subscribe if you haven't already. You can check out more content, and we'll all continue to enjoy the ever-growing, ever-changing, Marvel Cinematic Universe.